one countdown. Three, two, one. Good evening, folks. I'd like to call the February 16th, 2021 Select Board meeting to order. Um, this evening, I'll just share with you briefly, just a, a, sorry, as a quick overview. Tonight, um, Town Manager Bob Alasher, Superintendent of Schools John Doherty, have a brief statement to make to the group. From there, we're going to go uh, move to executive session uh, to discuss strategy with respect to civil court and administrative actions involving 59 Middlesex Avenue. And we will return to open session at 745 and continue with our agenda at that point. So uh, let me turn it over to, uh, to uh, Bob and Dr. Doherty. Okay, uh, thanks Mark. And uh, thanks for joining us, uh, John. <clears throat> On Thursday, January 14th, the superintendent, police chief and town manager first became aware of some issues involving individual school and town parentheses police department employees. That night at the school committee meeting, Dr. Doherty read a statement that we three had worked on that afternoon in the same collaborative fashion in which we always were. I, appreciate, I appreciated his inclusion of an apology for some materials that had been circulated within the school department. On Tuesday, January 19th, the town manager read a follow-up statement at a select board meeting that once again, we worked on together. I appreciated the apology issued to the community and especially to our teachers, along with the pledge that any school or town family problems will be solved. School and town personnel uh, met to discuss the issue broadly and understand more background from each other. Police officers present spoke as parents of Reading Public School students. Then we went off and met internally on both the town and the school sides for more dialogue. We are in the process of scheduling another larger meeting of town and school staff together. As you would expect, the logistics of such an in-person meeting are challenging during the pandemic. However, we are committed to continue the dialogue. Both John and I know we've not fully solved all related schools slash police issues, which continue to evolve at the national level. However, we've each been told by each other's staff that our collaborative statements and actions to date have made a difference and we'll continue to work together to continue to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks folks. Um, Carlo, I'm gonna ask if you would read the motion that I've just put up onto the screen. Sure. Move to go into executive session, including council of Greg Panini, BHPK Law, and Evie Free, Mieris and Harrington, staff members, Bob Lachure, Caitlin Saunders Asella, in order to discuss strategy with respect, with respect to litigation and pending actions involving 59 Middlesex Road, and that the select board chair declared that an open meeting may be detrimental, may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the body, and to reconvene an open session at approximately 7:45 p.m. tonight. Thanks, Carlo. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to take a roll call vote of uh, each of the board members. Mark, I'm sorry. Mark, I'm sorry. Uh, I would just suggest, I think Jody Mills is here from Maya as oh, well. It's right. maybe the, a friendly um, amendment to the motion to include her. Thank you. Um, I can make it friendly and instant. <laughs> Whoop, except my screen is misbehaving. I think it can just be oral if. Um, will the, uh, so Carla, we accept a friendly amendment to add Jody Mills from Maya? Yes, as amended. Right, and so just to, to get the second on that? Second. Thank you, Ann. Okay, I will take a roll call vote. As I see on the screen, Carlo? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Ann? Yes. And Mark, yes. So we will move to executive session returning approximately 745.
Ja, das ist ein Loch. Ich frage mal, ob ich kann, wenn ich einen brauche. Bitte. Hey Christine, welcome. There we go. Um, okay, and RCTV is back. Great. So I'll give you a three, two, one. We'll come back. Three, two, one. I'd like to call the select board back to order in open session. I just want to give kind of a, a brief overview of kind of where we're going to go from here this evening. So uh, as usual, we're broadcasting RCTV, Verizon Channel 33, Xfinity Channel 22, as well as Facebook Live, the link from RCTV and YouTube. This evening, we have public comment that we'll do a little bit after 825 at this point, maybe more like 8, 840, but let's see. Um, and then we also have two hearings. And in fact, we're about to open the hearings, um, one related to the right turn only uh, exiting Joshua Eaton Elementary School into Oak Street. The second will be related to Bertucci's. If there are uh, members of the public that would like to speak at those hearings, um, all you need to do is send an email to selectboard at ci.reading.ma.us before each of the hearings closes. And if you'd like to, you'll be able to, to speak. So we'll, we'll take a, a break when the hearings are open right before we close them um, and take our votes. So that's the only change uh, in terms of what, what we'll do there. Okay. Um, sorry, my screen's not moving. Um, the resources are nicely posted on RCTV these days, but if you come to the website, readingma.gov, you'll find all sorts of information on COVID, any vaccine updates that the town is aware of, and then special resources that people can reach out to. Um, the Coalition for Prevention and Support has a number of services, um, again, all available, and you can reach out to these by reaching Sammy Salkin, the outreach coordinator, ssalkin at ci.reading.ma.us, or call her 781-942-6756. Emergencies, please call 911. So in terms of our order of operations, we have the two hearings. We will um, read motions to open the hearings one at a time. Um, they'll then go to the COVID-19 response, liaison reports, public comment. We then are gonna have a discussion, uh, first pass at the uh, corridors and intersections on Markersburg Drive. Um, we do not have any applicants for the uh, outdoor dining at this point, so we won't do that. Uh, we have a report from BASC uh, to appoint members to various committees. Uh, we're going to hear from Ann on the communications policy, um, briefly discuss the records access policy proposal, and then approve meeting minutes, and, and we're off to the races. So let's move to um, opening the hearing on the Joshua Eaton right turn. Um, I'm not sure that I have this one. This is from the packet. Okay. Carlo, if you want, I will grab it from the packet unless you have it in front of you. Yeah, Mark, I'll share it. Oh, okay. great. Thanks, Bob. Little bigger, Bob, if you can. Okay, good. All right. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on February 16th, 2021 at approximately 7.45 p.m. remotely on Zoom to act on an amendment to the traffic and parking regulations specifically related to a right turn only from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. sign on the corner of Oak Street and Joshua Eaton School Driveway. A copy of the proposed documents regarding this topic will be made available in the select board packet and on the town's website at readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit, submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 4 p.m. on February 16, 2021 to town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of town manager, Robert Lomacher. Thanks, Carlo. Um, let me turn it over to Lieutenant Amendola, please. Okay, good evening. I'm actually gonna pass this one off. Um, Traffic Officer Scouten is gonna present to you if I can share my screen, um, just request. Okay, and here he is. Uh, 
Good evening. Good evening. So, um, Principal Ippolito had reached out. Um, she was having some issues with uh, the exiting traffic from the Josh Reed School during um, uh, drop off times in the morning. And we just took a look at the area and we figured that uh, a right turn only would, uh, would complement the um, existing traffic regulation on Oak Street. Uh, the existing traffic regulation um, at the end of Oak Street does not allow traffic to uh, enter off of Summer Ave uh, from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Um, so we looked at the area and we felt that the morning traffic was much heavier um, due to uh, competing with um, commuting traffic. So we felt that uh, the right turn only at Josh Street School at the Oak Street entrance and exit would uh, complement um, that issue. Uh, buses coming out, cars coming out, um, turning right with the existing traffic and not having like a crisscross problem. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Thanks, board members, any questions? Vanessa. Um, thanks for this. Um, so I vaguely recall, uh, so um, I just wanna clarify something first. Um, is this to, uh, because I remember, I think it was two plus years ago, we did change the um, no left turn, right turn only to this time of day. So I'm just clarifying is this the permanent change to it now? And, and we had done the trial before, or is this a different change from what we had done before? So this is a different change. Uh, this, this is kind of, um, this, this came up, it was about two years ago, you're correct, that we had, uh, we had made a right turn only at the corner of Oak and Summer at the stop sign. Um, and also you know, we, we had um, enhanced the drop off area on Summer Ave as well. Um, so once we did that, there was a little bit of an issue with traffic coming out of the school because all the traffic is, is pushed down to Summer Ave. So the traffic coming out of the school at the uh, Oak Street entrance, exit entrance, um, it's kind of given like a crisscross effect and it's holding up traffic. And it's just gonna make it easier for exiting traffic to come out of the school to take the right to go down to Summer Ave with all the flow of the traffic. So I, I'm not quite as familiar with this area as perhaps some others. Is the entrance itself is on Oak Street. So what we're doing is the, the traffic, it, before we were talking about Oak to summer, but now we're talking about the, what amounts to the driveway coming in and out of the school directly onto Oak? Correct. Okay. Um, I have no questions if, if the police and the principal are in um, favor of this and that I support it. Thanks, Vanessa. Any other comments, questions? All right, did anyone um, request to speak at the hearing? Any, any emails into the select board email? Bob? Uh, hi, Mark. There was a resident of Oak Street that sent in a question, I think, to the whole board, um, but I, I clarified what the hours of the signage were and he had no further comments or questions. And he responded, I responded to him as well. And he said, Bob had already taken care of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, no other comments that came in. Okay. So uh, we need a motion to close the hearing, please, Carla. Oh, I, I apologize, Mark. I have just one more question on a technicality. Okay, please, Vanessa. Um, uh, um, when we did this last time, we did a trial run for the school. Is that required here or not? I, because we, I remember you came before us twice to talk about this. So for, from a procedural perspective, can we close the hearing vote to approve and we're done? Do we have to go through? And this might be a better question for Bob. I, I just don't know. Uh, either way works. Fine, either way. On Oak Street, I think there was some question as to how the thing would work out and it worked out fine. Um, there's no requirement that it be a trial period. I'm fine then, thank you. 
Okay, Carla, motion to close the hearing, please. Uh, motion to close the hearing to install a right turn only sign at the Joshua Eaton Oak Street entrance, entrance slash exit. Is there second. a second? Second. Oh, thank you, Karen. We'll do a quick roll call vote. Actually, we'll do a regular roll call vote. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Okay. Um, uh, can I ask, uh, Officer Scott, can you um, stop sharing the screen and I will put the motion up in its stead? Carlo, um, if you could read, so under public safety hearing, the after the close, the next part of the motion. Yep. Move to approve amendment number 2021-01 of the traffic and parking regulations as presented. Great, is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Any further discussion? Not appearing, we will take the vote to uh, approve this amendment. So, Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Thank you, folks. Um, and Thank let's you. go. Let's go to the second hearing, the Bertucci's hearing. Um, so let's, Carlo, can you read the motion to open the hearing? Bob, do you happen to have that one handy as well? Uh, yeah, I have it too. I have it. There it is. Great, thanks. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on February 16th, 2021 at approximately 7.50 p.m. remotely on Zoom to act on a change of manager request from an annual all alcohol license at Pertucci's restaurant, 45 Walkersburg Drive, Reading, Mass. A copy of the proposed documents regarding this topic will be made available in the select board packet and on the town website at readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 4 p.m. on February 16th, 2021 to the town manager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of the town manager, Robert Lillishore. Thanks, Carlo. Um, do we have the applicant joining us this evening? Um, he's supposed to be and he was in the waiting room, but he's not anymore, so I'm not sure. Um, well, and I can okay. give you a little background. I was really hoping to ask him a question about his ghost kitchen, if any of you have read about that. Um, if you haven't, you really need to Google it. Um, the applicant has um, you know, passed the police um, requirements that you see in the packet, approval from the police. Um, this is a fairly, as straightforward as an application ever gets. Usually at such a hearing, um, always neighbors or abutters are welcome to speak. Um, that rarely happens. Um, what more often happens is the board reminds a new, um, a new manager about uh, you know, the coalition and the fact we take uh, alcohol serving to minors very seriously and welcomes them to town. And um, again, for any of you that don't know, you really need to Google Bertucci's Reading uh, Ghost Kitchen and, and you'll be very interested what you find. Um, so I would suggest that um, if the applicant can't make it tonight, that we may want to invite them to just join us for a, a welcome conversation at another time. Um, do members of the board have any questions on, on the application as it was presented? No. Uh, have any members of the public requested to speak? Not that I'm aware of. Nothing's coming. Kind of Send him an email real quick. I don't know if he'll respond, but because he was in the waiting room a few minutes ago. But... Hmm. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit behind. Actually, not too bad. Um, okay, I'm just I'm kind of stalling for about 10 more seconds of time here, and then I think we'll close the hearing. <laughs> so, um, point of information, uh, it's kind of a 
kind of a big change of manager license. So are we going to approve this without anybody showing up? Is Steve there? I just let him in. Awesome. Great. Awesome. Perfect Technology. Timing. Welcome, Steve. You are you are on on the the meeting. <laughs> oh, but you're muted. You need to unmute yourself first. Make sure your bottom left little microphone button. All there right. you go. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome. Wondering maybe if you could just introduce yourself. We um, we have the the packet in front of us. And we were hoping maybe you could introduce yourself, and then a few board members may want to address you as well. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Kasumbas. I'm the general manager of uh, the Petucci's in uh, Reading. I was previously uh, the general manager there for five years, um, but I, I left Massachusetts about a year ago, and I just moved back up and a couple of months ago, and then I took my old position back. Um, so I was, I was doing that previously in writing for five years, and I've been with the two G's um, since 2013. And then, like I said, a year off, I moved down to Florida um, and just moved back in time for the first snowstorm before uh, Halloween, and I've been, been back now. Timing is everything. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, board members, do you have uh, particular questions that you'd like to, to share? Karen. Um, just a comment. Thank you. Um, Steve, I'd like to welcome you back. We appreciate that this Bertucci's outlet has been able to stay open and we do we are quite serious as a board about supporting our restaurants whenever possible and um, this Bertucci's has been a, a wonderful uh, community resource supporting organizations like the Reading Scholarship Foundation. So, so we appreciate that, and uh, we'll buy lots of pizza. Thank you for coming back. Uh, thank, thank you. I appreciate that. And I apologize again for being late. I don't know why. I thought I was just waiting. I thought the other, the initial meeting was uh, delayed, so I was just sitting there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. We tend to run slightly long. <laughs> Um, so let me just um, add to, to Karen's welcome. I think one of the things that the board also likes to do is um, with all of the uh, licensees for liquor, um, we appreciate your vigilance in um, being very, very careful, um, obviously working with, with the police department, but making sure that minors are not getting served um, to make sure that you're aware of the resources of the Reading Coalition. Um, and I'm sure that they can you know, send materials to you if you're not already familiar with them. But um, one of the things that this board takes very seriously is kind of protecting our youth from uh, from alcohol and other other issues. And really appreciate the restaurant support in making sure that that happens. So we we ask that you just be very vigilant. Um, Caitlin will be you know working to make sure the licenses and things are are, are appropriate. But that's something very important to us, and, and we just. We appreciate your your seeing it as we do as well. I, I do as well. Yes. Thanks. Any other comments from board members? Not appearing. Any other uh, public that wanted to participate? Okay, Carla, can you make a motion to close the hearing, please? Uh, motion to close the hearing on the change of manager use at Pertucci's Walker's Book Right. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Any further discussion? Okay, let's take a vote on closing the hearing. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Carlo? Yes. And Mark? Yes. All right, with the hearing closed, um, the, we need a motion. Uh, Carlo, I can put it up if you would like. Here it is. Move to approve the change of manager request for an annual all alcohol restaurant license for Batucci's restaurant 45 Walker Brook Drive. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vanessa. Any further discussion? 
none appearing, we will take the vote. Um, Vanessa? Yes. Carlo? Yes. Karen? Yes. Anne? Yes. And Mark, yes, we are 5-0. Thank you, Steve, welcome back. Glad you came for the good weather. Welcome back to Massachusetts and to Reading. Thank you, I appreciate everything. Thanks. Have a good evening. All right, uh, we will move on on the agenda. Rick, sorry for our delay here. Um, COVID-19 response, let me turn it over to you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so a couple things, uh, as you probably saw on the website, we're down to about 100 or so, 101 active cases. Uh, that's down from 145 the week before. And so um, the town is in, um, is considered moderate risk or in the yellow uh, area, as are most of the surrounding towns as well. So things are moving in the right direction in terms of cases. And I don't have any particular clusters uh, to report that hasn't been that much in the schools uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> the big um, topic has been the vaccination clinics and what's going on there. Um, on February 5th, uh, we held a clinic in the field house. Um, and this was really to try out um, the layout and how the flow would work. Uh, were we to get to a point of being able to do mass vaccinations? Um, and so there were, you know, multiple um, chairs set out and check-in areas and, and so forth. Um, and it was, you know, successful. I think there were about 100 doses given, mostly phase one um, recipients, I think all phase one recipients. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a few bugs were found here and there about, um, you know, patient flow and communication and, and so forth, nothing major. Um, and so I think the, the feeling of incident command coming out of that was that, um, you know, if and when we got large amounts of vaccine, um, we're in a position, we have the infrastructure, the planning, um, done to be able to administer uh, large numbers of vaccine. Um, on February 9th, uh, there was a smaller uh, vaccination clinic uh, giving mostly second doses to first responders and people in phase one. And then um, last Friday, as you probably saw, we, we gave, um, I think it was about 98 doses to uh, people in phase two, uh, residents over the age of 75. And there were a couple doses given to, second doses given to healthcare workers. And there was a much smaller uh, clinic today, about 21 doses. Again, um, these are um, second doses for people in phase one who got their first in January. Um, we have 20 doses remaining, which uh, the plan by incident command is to provide those to frail homebound um, elders um, over the age of 75. And that'll happen in the next few days uh, with home visits. Um, the major problem, as I think we discussed last time, really hasn't changed, is vaccine supply. Um, you know, we thought we were gonna be getting um, 100 doses a week, at least, um, and we were told, uh, we actually requested, uh, according to Peter Miranda, our interim health director, we actually requested, I think 1,100 doses. Um, and uh, we were told we were gonna get zero uh, for next week. And many other towns were told they were gonna get zero. And, you know, it seems like, you know, it's pretty clear the state has decided, probably because the governor's under a lot of pressure, has decided to move, you know, to uh, the vaccine, to these mass vaccination sites um, and to pharmacies, uh, CVS, Walgreens, Stop and Shop, I mean, there are a number of them, and move them away from hospitals, local boards of health and uh, doctor's offices. I know the Mass Medical Society is up in arms over the fact that uh, physician offices aren't, aren't getting the doses they want as well. Hopefully, um, in the next, you know, two to four weeks, I've heard that the national supply might uh, be better. And if so, um, 
that'll trickle down to the state, which will trickle down to us. And so we'll just have to uh, play it by ear. In the meantime, we're encouraging residents um, on our website to, you know, if, they, if they're in the category at currently 75 plus or any of the phase one categories to, you know, get their vaccinations wherever they, they can. Um, and I guess lastly, I would just mention that um, school testing is going to start, um, actually started this week with athletes and, uh, and some extracurricular uh, staff and students. And then uh, there'll be a slow rollout starting next week. Um, apparently, uh, John Doherty had said that they, they got over a thousand um, consent forms from parents. Um, so, you know, that, that's positive. And uh, they have the kits, um, they're waiting. I don't know if they're still waiting for some training uh, from the state for the uh, school nurses to be able to, to do this. Uh, but that's the plan in terms of the school testing. Um, I think that's all I have. I don't know, if, Bob, if you have any other updates. Sure, thanks, Rick. Um, just to follow up, we did request 1,000 doses of Pfizer in addition to the 100 doses that we thought we would get uh, weekly. The Pfizer vaccine is um, one that was requiring a lot more cold storage, so we thought we'd have a better chance to get it. Um, although we have not yet received it, I would like to thank Dr. Walker at the Melrose Wakefield Hospital uh, for agreeing to uh, store the vaccine for us if we're ever successful. Um, that's much appreciated. And with a very quick turnaround, I'd also like to thank Senator Lewis, Representatives Jones and Haggerty for writing a good letter of support for our request to Mass DPH. So although it has not been filled this week and does not look like it will be until the federal um, supply eases up, you know, hope springs eternal. We're still ready, we're still prepared. Um, but I, I unfortunately to agree, have to agree with uh, Rick's assessment for our 75 and older population, um, you know, please visit the sites that the state is encouraging you to. One change that was made, I believe, late last week is that you can now bring a caregiver. Um, you know, there's certainly some legitimate caregivers out there, and I also understand some caregivers for hire have sprung up, unfortunately. Um, so the, the real effort by the state is understanding that, um, you know, some of the elderly uh, cannot easily make these sites even you know, to give away another dose to someone who will take them. It's, that's how strongly they feel that they want to use this method. So you know, I, we have to stand aside and be respectful of that for now. I would mention also that um, that caregiver um, exception is, is, I think, only at the uh, state-managed sites. That's um, right. Like, so if you go to CVS or Walgreens, uh, that's not the case. Yeah, thank you. And that's all. Thanks, folks. Uh, board members, any questions before questions? Just to, to add to what both uh, Rick and Bob said, I believe that CVS has a pretty organized way to, to um, go into their system to see if there are doses available. So that should just be added to people's thinking in terms of where you might be able to go. Comments or questions from the board? Great. All right. Thank you, folks. Thanks for keeping it going, folks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the update. Uh, on to liaison reports. Who would like to go first? And you're in the bullseye at the moment. Would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to a set of documents that are in our packet. We had a pretty hefty packet this week. I just wanted to make sure you were all aware that some documents um, relating to the ad hoc Committee on Human Rights are there. I know in a previous meeting I'd mentioned there'd been a unanimous vote uh, to approve the uh, a letter and a um, and the proposal itself. That is in the packet, uh, as is Bob's complete statement about the budget that he made previously to the board, as well as a supplemental statement from Carlo. Um, so I just wanted to draw your attention to that. That has also been forwarded. Um, by Jackie uh, to the Board of um, Library Trustees, as well as to the school committee. Um, so that's on that front. Um, and Carlo, if you want to share anything else, you're welcome to. Um, so 
I'm fine. You said it well. Thank you. Okay. Um, then relative to, um, and, and Mark, you're welcome to, to jump in at any point. Um, on this front, I just wanted to update the board that Mark and I, uh, back in June, had reached out to Bob and Chief Clark um, to have a conversation about what the Reading Police Department's policies are. And we, d we collectively decided to place those conversations on hold as um, the state was figuring out what it was going to do with respect to police reform. Um, as the chief had pointed out, you know, there would have to be probably many revisions in light of that um, that legislative package. That package is now complete, so we're planning to um, resume um, that conversation and take a look at those policies. Um, I uh, this is probably a conversation for our future agenda topics, but um, I was also thinking about what we might, as the board, want to do with respect to inviting. Um, the chief or the department to present to the full board perhaps sometime in the spring um, about our about our department's policies. We have, but this is also recognizing that the the policies still might change somewhat because there will be regulatory changes that will come down um, in light of police reform. So it it's always going to be a little bit of a moving target. Um, to, to pin down what these policies are and, and we have to recognize they're subject to change. Um, but we thought it was worth moving forward with the conversation even in light of the fact that there will be no doubt additional changes coming. I would, I would welcome that. I think that's a great idea. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, anything else, Anne, that you all set for? Reports? That's all. Didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add, Mark, but that was all. No, I... very, very well, very well stated. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, between the legislation and COVID, that slowed things down. But now is a great time to to get the discussions going. So that's great. Um, Karen, um, um, not too much to update. Just that um, I know our agenda has been quite busy. Um, uh, the Climate Advisory Committee reached out to me again today. They do have. The uh, RMLD is in the process of defining their energy purchase policy um, going forward and could use some input from Reading. So they do have um, some information they would like to present to us and ask us to submit through the CAB. And so we need to get them on the agenda, agenda earlier rather than later. And if it's possible, could we get them on the March 3rd agenda? We had uh, mentioned this at the last meeting. This is for Climate Advisory? Yep, they would like to present some thoughts on energy, energy purchase input for RMLD as they update their energy purchase policy. So the sooner they can get us to hear it and be okay with it, and and then our job would be to ask our cab member um, Vivek to pass it on to the RMLD. Should be a, a pretty short agenda item. They have slides they can send us in advance. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Vanessa. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I have two reports. The first is on the water tower. Um, Bob, thank you for sending out those contracts for the cell service providers that the residents were looking for. Um, the second is I was hoping to recommend that a project plan be put forward for this project. Um, I know uh, Brian had already started this, but something that leans less towards the technical of when each of the stages of the project um, of the construction are happening and more the, the pre-planning. So um, when is the RP going to be posted? Um, when can we anticipate um, receiving submissions? When will we then you know, choose a final one? Um, how often will it be, it will, uh, with what cadence will it be presented to the select board, where will CPBC be involved from the building committee, and have that all mapped out so that both, so that this board and the residents um, and anyone else who might be a contributor to this or a stakeholder um, can, sort of, can see where it's happening and, and know what to expect. I think it'll go a long way in clearing up some of the confusion that we've had sort of leading up to this point. Um, so a, a loose timeline of that, you know, with the understanding, of course, that 
subject to change because of this construction. Um, there, I did receive a question that the design had changed uh, from the original proposal to what we're seeing now. So perhaps at a future agenda, um, we can you know, revisit what that project timeline looks like and when we can start discussing things like that, as well as what the final um, area will look like. Um, so that's one. For the second, uh, the school committee on Thursday appointed um, Mr. Malachewski as the new superintendent. Um, Mr. Malachowski is currently the superintendent resident in the Medford Public Schools, and he's completing his doctorate in the spring. Um, he's an adjunct professor at Salem State University, Gordon and Endicott Colleges, um, and he's a district consultant for the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, he has a background as an uh, elementary school principal, a high school math teacher, and he started his career as a middle school um, special education teacher. So um, he is tentatively scheduled to start July 1st. I believe they're working through the contract details. Um, this was a really intensive process. Um, uh, included the school committee, included 17 members of the selection committee, numerous public forums. Um, so I just want to thank everyone who participated in that. It's an exciting time for those of us that have um, kids in the school system. Um, so letting everyone know that um, well, if everything goes well, we will soon have a new superintendent. So, and, and my thanks to Dr. Doherty um, for all of his years of service and dedication to the community. Thanks, Vanessa. Carlo? Thanks. Uh, while I didn't attend, I got caught up on the CPDC meeting regarding the Chronicle building. And we're going to move forward with the two-story building. Uh, when it was proposed originally as a four-story building, they're going to be 72 one-bedroom units. They are foregoing the city lift um, system. There's going to be nine parking spaces with seven EV charging stations. Uh, that math doesn't really make sense to me, but for 72 units, but that's what, what was uh, approved. And there's going to be you know bike racks uh, inside the garage, uh, adjacent to the building, and a 600 square foot commercial space on Main Street. And um, other fun stuff going on, but that project is moving forward. That's all I have. Great. Thanks, Carlo. Um, so I've got uh, three updates. First, um, the board had um, voted and asked me to send a note to our legislators regarding the safe election provisions being extended to cover our election, but ideally through June to cover that of, of others as well. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with our legislators. Bob has had a couple of conversations with our legislators. Um, the The new legislative session hadn't been organized in terms of committees and taking up bills and things like that until last Friday, is my understanding. And you can correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I think that was the, the rough date. Um, and we keep uh, getting reassurances from our legislators that this is uh, on the top of the list, that the Senate president has it on the top of the list, that the um, the, the House has it on the list. Everybody is is pushing to get it done very quickly, um, and hopefully very quickly means like in the next week or so. Um, but we'll see how quickly they can they can um, move forward on it. Um, the real issue that, that that relates to is what information the town can send out to all voters um, in terms of ballots. You know, would you like to get a, a mailing ballot? Um, so, you know, hopefully that will get done in, in a timely enough fashion that we can actually get some stuff to, to go out the door. Um, but if you remember from, I think, two meetings ago when Laura Jim was here and talked a little bit about um, the town being very receptive to mail-in ballots in, in any event. So um, hopefully that will progress. That's one. Second is, um, although there hasn't been another um, permanent building committee meeting, pursuant to the, the last meeting, um, I... Uh, worked with, uh, with Ryan to complete the application for the PDC for their consideration of the water tank project to move forward. Um, and that has been sent to the PBC and I haven't heard back from them. So I think that they have the information that they need now to, to consider this at their next meeting, which I think is early March, but I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, also, as, as if you remember, the board um, had authorized Vanessa to, to take point uh, on on these discussions, so part of the the activity there was to make sure that 
it was clear that, that Vanessa would be the point person. Uh, last but not least, Council on Aging uh, had a meeting and um, the, the concern remains making sure that uh, elders are able to get vaccinations. Um, the group understood and, and interestingly, many on that, that board uh, are, in, are in the earlier phases and had all talked a little bit about their experience. Many of them had been able to get vaccinations but were encouraging of other people to keep going. They expressed some concern about folks that are shut in and Bob, thanks for uh, making sure that that's happening uh, with the Board of Health so that we can get uh, those doses we have to folks that aren't able to get out of their homes right now. And that is, that's what I've got. Bob, any updates from you? Thank you, Mark. Uh, last uh, week, uh, Mark, Karen, um, our Senator, two representatives and some staff uh, met to discuss uh, green communities, specifically with RMLD kind of as the focus. And um, both our senator and, and one of our reps were working on two types of legislation to try to obviate the need for all four towns in a light department serve that serves more than one town to all agree. And um, each thought, you know, either method would work. Um, I got an update slightly later in the week that it looked like the representative's um, effort was probably more likely to work. So, you know, we'll kind of keep an eye on that. Um, letting no opportunity pass, I also reminded our uh, elected officials about the elections situation we're in and the fact that outdoor liquor licenses would be most welcome uh, and that the spring was just around the corner. So you know, hopefully we'll hear some good news on that. Um, Carlo, just to add some more information, that Chronicle building just has seven bedrooms proposed. So the ratio between parking spaces and bedrooms isn't quite as appalling as it may have seemed. Oh, I'm sorry. Seven units. It's units. Seven units. Sorry. Seven units. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, late last week, S&P affirmed our AAA rating. Um, I always like to add U.S. Treasuries remain lower rated at AA+. We have a debt sale for some enterprise fund debt that was previously approved by town meeting uh, scheduled for this Thursday. Um, the board will be asked to approve those results as well as authorize a borrowing from the MWRA at your next meeting. And that's really important. So if it snows, we're going to have to work around um, how we can do that. But that, that's an important thing. Um, it's also going to require your signatures. Um, so we'll also work around that. But as long as the vote can be held to accept the results and approve the MWRA, borrowing will be in good shape. And lastly, uh, I just want to repeat that on the 24th, the school committee is in front of FinCom with their budget, and the town will be in front of FinCom on the 3rd and 10th of March. If the board uh, thinks it will be uh, pre physically present in Zoom with a quorum, um, we're certainly happy to host you. Uh, the meetings are well covered uh, by RCTV, though. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Um, folks, in terms of, of guidance for those meetings, would it make sense to post? To, to ask the, uh, Bob to post for us. So this is, let's see if we can get our dates here. Sorry, Bob, you said the 24th is the school committee budget? Correct. 3-3 uh, three, three and 3-10 for the town budget? That's right. Um, I would be interested in attending. Is, are there enough other folks interested that we should post? We should post as a, per, as a precaution. Okay, please. Uh, Bob, one question for Claire. Uh, can you repeat those dates? Sure. Um, February 24th, which is a Wednesday, uh, the school committee will meet with FinCom. Um, I think the time is 7.30, I'll check. And then uh, the following two, two Wednesdays, March 3rd and March 10th, they'll meet with the town departments. And then they also expect to meet on March 17th, which is uh, certainly going to be a fun night, uh, and vote on the budget as well as any other warrant articles with green beer, I heard. Virtual. <laughs> Virtual green beer, right. <laughs> That's not sounding great. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, board members? Okay, let us roll on to Walker's Brook Drive. Um, Julie, are you going to uh, lead the discussion? Hi, um, actually, if it's okay with you, Mark, I'd like to have Andrew um, give a little introduction and then I think we still need our consultants to be let into the meeting. Excuse me, Mark, did you wanna do public comment? 
Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. My apologies. Sorry, um, Julie. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I looked at it and just went right to eight. I looked at the time instead of the topic. <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, let's do public comment. So, um, Caitlin, do we have two people that want to speak tonight? Yep. Great. And is it Mike is first and then memory test Jackie? Yep. Great. Okay. Let Mike in, please. Hey, Mike. Oh, you are muted. How you doing? Great. How you doing? Good, welcome to the you. welcome Good to the board time. meeting. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. I just wanted to follow up on a past conversation in hopes of presenting another idea, if it makes sense. Obviously, regarding the water tower, uh, the town manager recently stated that the replacement of the water tank is in the vicinity of $5 million today. Knowing that the project may not break ground this year in conjunction with the increased cost of material, labor, and especially change orders, is it possible that we may exceed that figure? That thought took me back to December of 2016 when Weston and Sampson provided a cost estimate outlining the two options, maintaining versus replacing the tank. At that time, it was more cost effective to replace the water tank over a 40 year span as compared to maintaining, as compared to maintaining. But knowing the price of material alone has currently spiraled out of control, especially steel, has the town manager or the town engineer received an updated cost, com cost com comparison, maintaining versus replacing over the next 20, 30, and 40 years. Not only to maintain, but to make sure the tank would meet OSHA standards. I ask simply due to this being a significant 40 year investment with multiple high risk variables at a time when material alone is severely inflated. So my question, and please consider, is are we better off financially to look into working what we already have? Great. Thanks, Mike. I think, um, Thank comments. you. All right. Mark, if I may. Please. Uh, Bob, can we add that to the list of issues or um, questions to be answered for our next, the next time we report in on this to the public? Sure. Thank you. Um, can you let Jackie in, please, Caitlin? Hey, Hi, Jackie. Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks very much uh, to the board members and staff for adding the public records access policy proposal on your agenda later tonight. Uh, public records are information stored and recorded by federal, state, or local governments, which any member of the public can access. Um, the importance of public records really can't be overstated. They're, they're key to maintaining accountability and, and transparency in government. Uh, RFPs and contracts executed by the town uh, are public records. They involve the spending of, of taxpayer money. Uh, they legally bind the town uh, and they're um, meant to obtain goods and services for the benefit of, of Reading residents. Uh, as we've talked about before on the town website, some RFPs and contracts are available, others aren't. Um, and if there's not any way of knowing what's available, there's no way of knowing uh, that it even exists. And you know, we've seen certainly in the past year, but even well before then, how central the internet and uh, digital records are to all of our lives and to, and to government. And there's really no good reason not to use that internet and digital access uh, for uh, public records access. Um, 
the select board has a policy in its general operating procedure on public records in section 1.4.2 it, it commits the select board to a philosophy that quote citizens should have access to public records not exempt by law um, currently that proposal it, it seems to be ineffective and so um, we're asking the select board to update the policy make it more specific make it more comprehensive um, we feel like our policy proposal that we submitted last week will go uh, a long way toward achieving this goal. And, and again, thank you for uh, taking time to consider it later tonight. Um, and we're around uh, to answer any questions now or throughout the process. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Um, all right, now, sorry, sorry for going out of order. Now let's move on to, to Walker's work. Oh, I'm sorry. Many sounds. <laughs> so I'm sorry, Julie. Uh, uh, Andrew, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm catching up with myself. Andrew. <laughs> no worries. Uh, thank you all, and good evening, board members. I'm Andrew McNichol, staff planner, as you know, and I'm joined tonight with Julie Mercy, our community development director, and Aaron Schaefer, our economic development director, and we are also joined with Wing Wang and Jason Gavin of Green International Affiliates. And I just wanted to start by quickly saying that we started this project with Green International about two years ago now, and even longer if you include the Eaton Lakeview 40D process in which Green International peer reviewed that project for. Uh, that 40D process led to the outcome and the finding that the town as a whole needed to look at our major road corridors and their surrounding connections. Uh, we asked ourselves how we can improve these areas and in what ways can we improve them even outside of just traffic uh, congestion and mitigation. So now two years later, two large public meetings later and multiple, multiple staff meetings later, uh, we're here tonight and we are happy to have Wing and Jason present to you the conceptual ideas for a number of major roadways in Reading. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off to Wing and the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. I am just going to try to share my screen and pull up our presentation. And uh, let me see if I uh, make sure I can do this right. Okay. Can anybody see my um, screen? Yes. Okay. Um, just to make sure that the bandwidth works good, I'm just going to stay off, uh, stop my camera real quick. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Wing Wong. I'm the traffic group manager here at Green International. Uh, with me tonight is Jason Galvin, who has been very involved uh, in this study. Uh, tonight, we're going to briefly go over the project history, the study area, and we really want to focus on the concepts of Walker's Brook, as well as the Ash Street and Main Street uh, concepts. As men Andrew mentioned, we started this process down back in 2018. And, uh, you know, when we identify potential safety improvements, uh, mitigation measures that can uh, can be done at the Lakeview Avenue and Walker's Brook intersection. Uh, the feedback we got from the community was that don't just look at this, this intersection and come up with improvement options by itself. Uh, they really wanted to have a holistic uh, approach to the surrounding areas. Uh, so working with the town very closely uh, to come up with a comprehensive study scope. Um, and here we are tonight after uh, new more uh, coordination uh, with the town as well as the public. Uh, the purpose of this particular uh, map here, just just to show you uh, our study area. Um, if you can see my cursor, the uh, roadways corridors are highlighted in green. Um, is where our study corridors consisted of. Um, so Walker's Brook, obviously the main one, uh, but also we we uh, evaluated uh, Washington Street as well. Uh, we looked at the Ash Street corridor. We also looked at the John Street corridor. Uh, all the yellow circles that you see here are all the study intersections that were, were evaluated as well. Uh, in addition, the Eastern Gateway District redevelop redevelopment study was also something that we consider when we looked into the potential improvement options, as well as any potential uh, connection improvements that could be made with new crossing as it relates to the Market Basket Plaza. So again, the study really encompasses this in the whole Thai area, so all of the concepts that we did uh, evaluated we're really uh, taking that into consideration and not just that uh, one isolated area. Okay, so let's move into the concepts for Walker's Brook. 
the first thing we did for this whole entire study was to identify the deficiencies and the improvement opportunities that exist out there. Uh, I'm not going to read each one of the deficiencies that we identified, but the major opportunities here uh, include better accommodations and connections for all users, pedestrians, bicyclists, as well as safety improvements at all the signalized intersections along the entire corridor. One of the first options that we identify is a road diet option. Uh, this option converts the middle two lanes into a shared turn lane while shifting the space within the roadway to accommodate bicycles. This is very similar to what MassDOT has done for Main Street. Um, so if you picture that, this will be exactly like that. Uh, while this option certainly provides a host of benefits, uh, the biggest drawback would be traffic operations. The traffic volume on Walker's Brook is right at the upper thresholds of implementing a road diet um, based on industry standards and experiences. Uh, but this option does achieve a goal to improve safety as well as accommodations for all users while needing minimal impacts to adjacent land use. So this is why we like this option. Um, here in some pictures, uh, the one right in the middle uh, on the top row here, this would be a very similar and a great representation of what it could look like. Uh, for, for the road diet option. As you can see, the middle turn lane becomes a uh, two-way left turn lane. And then uh, at signalized intersections, that shared usage becomes a dedicated turn lane. Uh, and then the bicycle would be on the right-hand side of the row. However, it wouldn't be directly adjacent to the travel lane. It would actually be more somewhat closer to the top right-hand corner where we do have some buffer um, to shield the bicycle lane away from uh, traffic. And this is very consistent with the current uh, mass DOT approach to separate bike, bicycle uh, accommodation on a roadway such as Walker's Brook. The photos on the bottom are potential options that could be done for treatment at uh, intersections uh, under this scenario. A second option that we came up with uh, is a shared use path. Uh, and this shared use path would be uh, placed on one side of Walker's Brook and for this, we're proposing to put it on the market basket side or the south side of Walker's Brook. And the main reason for that is to limit impacts to the surrounding areas as much as possible, especially from an environmental standpoint. Um, on the north side, uh, there is a brook. And if we put the share use path over there, uh, we would essentially fill it. So we're trying to avoid that and uh, make this project as feasible as possible. Traffic operation is essentially the same which is a huge advantage over option one. Uh, and what I mean by the same means it's the same as current uh, conditions, we'll have just four travel lanes. Um, but this option is gonna be more costly and is gonna require some uh, land uh, taking as well as some utility relocation. But we believe this particular option offers a partnership with the commercial properties in the area. And it brings, uh, because it does bring benefit to everybody in terms of connectivity to all the commercial um, destination in this area and as well as streetscape uh, as well too. So on the pictures uh, of what it could look like, uh, on the top right-hand corner is a picture that is actually very good representation of what it could look like on Walker's Brook. Uh, for example, on the right-hand side, uh, the commercial parking lots would be over here and most likely they will not be impacted. Uh, and then you have the share use path and then a uh, green space uh, for streetscaping and, and a buffer away from the row. And you have your four lanes of traffic. Um, within the roadway itself. And the bottom uh, graphics are again examples of what uh, shared use path treatment could look like at intersections. Um, so this is actually going to be our preferred uh, option is a shared use path. Okay, so let's go to general way where this all started. Um, so while we're doing the review, as mentioned, we identify uh, several safety uh, deficiencies that uh, certainly have opportunities to address, as some of you may know. Uh, Lakeview Ave does not uh, come into Walker's Brook uh, as part of the signal general way. It's unsignalized, and because of how close it is, it really could lead to um, some conflicts as well as traffic operation uh, issues here. Um, and overall, again, just, just a lot of things going on within one small area, uh, a lot of high conflict points. Uh, so certainly some um, options here or some opportunities here to improve this. Um, so this is a slide that we showed to the town staff as we were coordinating. Uh, the idea here was just to kind of show all of the different options that we have looked at uh, at this particular intersection. On the bottom, uh, these, these were the working sketches that we had uh, considering what would happen if we try a double roundabout here um, to make things safer, uh, less conflict points. 
um, more efficient traffic. Um, but as you can see, all the different options that we have, um, either the roundabouts were too small for the vehicles that were here, or we have too much land impacts to adjacent properties. So um, we decided to move on from these ones on the bottom. Um, we did look at a single roundabout. We did look at potentially even a peanut um, shape. Um, and then also we looked at what would be just the signal lights that you have and what that would look like. And ultimately we came down to two options, uh, the single lane roundabout as well as the signal lights option. The roundabout option uh, we like a lot because from a roundabout standpoint, it does improve safety and it does improve operations. Uh, that's what they do. Um, so they certainly will serve that purpose and address the deficiencies. This would also allow vehicles from general way to take a left out of uh, the Market Basket Plaza, which is something that um, we've heard uh, from the community as one of the um, uh, desirable features if we go forward with uh, potential improvements. Um, however, this does require um, quite a bit of land impact. Um, as you can see over here on 155 uh, Walkers Brook, uh, the driveway is, is very close to the roundabout itself. So certainly from an operation standpoint, uh, that is something we have to look at very carefully. Um, there is a, a pretty decent chunk of land taken from Market Basket Plaza, as well as wetland filling uh, over these wooded area as well. Um, and then on the other side at 130 John Street, uh, we, we do um, eat into the driveway or yard of, of that property as well, so certainly not ideal. Um, and then the bank driveway here as well, uh, we would have to close that also. Uh, and in addition, because of John Street, which is located just north of this intersection, um, its, its location relative to a roundabout is also not ideal. Uh, typically, we want to have a side street a little bit further away or have it go into the roundabout. So that's unfortunately another drawback there as well. Um, so when we came back and looked into the signalized option, um, we decided that we, we really like this option from an engineering standpoint. Um, under this particular uh, option, we would signalize the Lake UF uh, approach. However, we will take away uh, the bank driveway. Um, and that way we're not adding an additional phase to the traffic signal. It would operate very similar today in terms of phasing. Um, the driveway coming out of the bank will be shifted to Lakeview instead. Um, so they will still have two driveways, but it will be coming out of Lakeview to again, help reduce conflict points. Uh, make the signal system uh, uh, um, uh, operational more efficiently. So it's sort of a balance with everything. And in terms of right-of-way impacts, uh, the bank property would be the only one. Um, so that ends up being um, our preferred option in terms of what might be possible here. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jason at this point. Uh, he's a traffic engineer with over five years experience and has worked on a lot of traffic studies and design projects. He's a well-rounded engineer, and uh, he's going to walk you through the concepts that we developed for uh, the Washington Street corridor, as well as the Ash Street and John Street corridors. So Jason, go ahead. Thanks, Wing. Um, so as Wing stated earlier, um, part of what we wanted to do was um, choose a study area that uh, encompasses and provides a good overall um, look into the area and allows us to complete a, um, a more holistic study um, for our evaluations. Uh, and with one of the goals being for this study uh, to improve the multimodal access and connectivity uh, between two of the most um, common and popular commercial destinations within the, within the town being downtown Reading and Walker's Brook Corridor. Uh, so as Wing stated, we took a close look into the Walker's Brook Corridor. In addition to that, we looked at the Washington Street Corridor as well as it does provide the most direct and convenient connection between downtown Reading and Walker's Brook. Uh, so Washington Street Corridor uh, is a fairly uh, moderate to low volume corridor, low speed. Um, it is fairly narrow. You can see uh, the existing cross section, the total travel way is about 24 feet wide and consists of two 12 foot wide travel lanes, one in each direction. Um, and there are sidewalks provided on both sides with some small grass strips and buffers between the roadway and the sidewalks. Um, however, one of the drawbacks that we saw and one of the deficiencies we identified here is that there are no bicycle accommodations on this corridor today. So, you know, if the uh, shared use path or uh, the separated bike lane option is implemented along Walker's Brook, we do want to provide some type of bicycle connection to that uh, new corridor on Walker's Brook. Um, so we looked into a couple different options. Uh, we did look into what would be needed to provide bike lanes here. 
Um, unfortunately, due to the narrow pavement width and relatively narrow right of way, um, widening of the road would be needed here to accommodate bikes. Uh, and that would be, wide, widening would be difficult. Um, there are tight, um, as I said, right of way. So widening to the north would entail property owner impacts and extensive negotiations. Uh, and then to the south, there are utility poles aligned within the buffer between the sidewalk and the roadway. Um, so while, while that could be done in the future, it would take more, um, a longer time to kind of um, come to fruition uh, and extensive costs and property owner utility coordination would be needed. Uh, so what we had kind of identified as a shorter term improvement would be to stripe share rows along the roadway, um, which is shown here on the right hand side. Um, just to increase driver awareness of bicyclists um, that would be traveling along the roadway and sharing the road with vehicles. Uh, these could be implemented with signage as well that would further increase awareness of drivers for bicyclists on the roadway uh, until you know something more um, accommodating for bikes could come to plan and be uh, implemented on the sport. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, so in addition to the Walker Street, uh, the Washington Street corridor, the main intersection there that connects downtown Reading to that Washington Street corridor is the intersection shown here of Main Street and Washington Street. Um, and it, this study intersection was identified as one of the high crash locations in our study area. Uh, so we wanted to take a closer look at this intersection and see what was going on. So on the left-hand side, you can see some arrow diagrams that represent the existing lane configurations. And what we saw as a main contributor to the safety deficiencies here were the lack of the left turn, exclusive left turn or protected left turn lanes along the uh, Main Street uh, approaches here. You can see that both Main Street approaches are two lane approaches, but they have a shared through left turn lane uh, and there are no exclusive left turn lanes provided. Uh, so what that does is it, it uh, contributes to an increased frequency of rear ends and angle collisions, uh, particularly, you know, if you're driving behind someone and they come to an unexpected stop to yield to oncoming traffic to take a left turn, the person behind them might not expect them to stop. Uh, so they could potentially be following too close uh, or just not paying attention. And you know, us Massachusetts drivers don't always use our blinkers, so, you know, that could contribute to some rear ends. And in addition, if a left turn gets uh, a little anxious and impatient with not finding a gap in the oncoming traffic, they could try to shoot a gap that's not long enough, uh, and that could result in an angle collision between the left turn and an oncoming through vehicle. So those were the two most prominent crash sites that we saw here, in a large part due to the lack of exclusive left turn lanes on Main Street. Uh, we also uh, identified some operational issues, particularly during the PM peak hours, the intersection does operate over capacity with relatively long vehicle delays and queues, uh, and the signal equipment is relatively outdated. So these were some of the deficiencies we saw, uh, and what we're proposing to uh, that could improve these deficiencies, as you can see on the right-hand side, we are proposing some lane configuration changes to the Main Street approaches. Um, the most uh, significant change would be along the Main Street northbound approach here, you can see that uh, we are converting this from a two lane approach to a three lane approach, uh, adding a exclusive left turn lane that would be um, also added would be a protected left turn phase with, within the signal operations there so that there would be no conflicts between through vehicles in the southbound direction and left turn vehicles, uh, northbound left turn vehicles. Um, so while we are adding that left turn lane, we are also provide, still providing two through lanes, which provides an operational benefit because the uh, traffic volumes in the northbound direction here are pretty heavy. Um, and now that we are adding that left turn lane to the northbound approach and keeping two through lanes, we do need to modify the southbound lane configuration. Uh, as existing, there are two through lanes, uh, but now that we're taking one of the southbound receiving lanes and converting it to a northbound left turn, uh, we do need to get rid of one of those through lanes. So what we're doing is converting that to a left turn only lane so that there's one left turn only lane and then one shared through and right turn lane. Now, this um, lane configuration on the southbound approach does tie into what MassDOT is proposing along this corridor, along Main Street, just south of here, south of the rail railroad tracks. Um, it does end that two lane section in the southbound direction a little earlier than what MassDOT was proposing. Uh, but we don't expect that to be a major change and it should be able to be included 
uh, in the NAS-DOT NAS um, lane configurations change moving forward. Um, so that will increase safety. You have the exclusive left turn lanes with exclusive protected phases within the signal. Um, it does improve traffic operations during the peak hours as well, reducing the vehicle delays and queues that we saw in existing conditions. Uh, and then in addition to those, we would propose to modify, you know, up modernize the traffic signal equipment that's out there, replace the old signal heads with some newer signal heads with some back plates and the rectal reflective borders around the edges there to increase signal head visibility. Um, so all of these proposed improvements that could be implemented here would provide some safety benefits at this high crash location. Uh, and then what this tie, how this ties into the overall goal and study area, as I briefly went over, um, it will enhance the multimodal connectivity between the two primary commercial areas in the town, Walker's Brook and downtown, but then also a major recreational area, Lake Q here, you know, just on the, the border of Reading and Wakefield. Um, so these improvements along Washington Street, Walker's Brook, and the intersection of Washington and Maine uh, will increase that connectivity and multimodal access. Another high crash location that we saw, and I'm sure a lot of you folks are familiar with, is the intersection of Main Street and Ash Street, just south of Main Street and Washington Street intersection. Uh, so similarly, we did first look at the existing conditions to identify deficiencies that are out there. Uh, and one of the main things that we saw is there are a lot of vehicle conflict points within a very small area here, some of them being uncontrolled. So for starters, we have the MBTA at grade railroad crossing here. So there's a crossing just south of the intersection on Main Street and also on a crossing on Ash Street as well. So you have those two railroad crossings going on. We also have the intersection here of Ash and Main with Ash Street operating under stop controls. You have another sort of separate, but sort of the same intersection here with Ash Street and the Market Basket driveway here that leads into the back of the Market Basket Plaza. Uh, so you have this intersection with no control. Both of the, you know, Ash Street does not have a stop sign here, nor does the Market Basket driveway. And then you also have the McDonald's driveway here. So you have all those conflict points here, just east of this intersection, uh, mainly you know, operating almost under the same intersection. So those are uh, a lot of the deficiencies that we saw. In addition, there's a particularly long pedestrian crossing across this leg of the intersection at Main Street with no safe pedestrian refuge to split that crossing up. Um, and th those, there were some operational issues as well, particularly on the, the uh, Ash Street or Market Basket Drive intersection here, particularly during the peak hour. So first we took a look at um, if we kept the intersection point at Main Street the same, what are some potential improvements we could implement here? Uh, so this is one of the short to midterm options that we looked at. Uh, some of the advantages here, you know, you can see here the pedestrian crossing distance is pretty significantly reduced due to teeing up and shortening those corner radii at the intersection. Uh, and now we have some more defined intersections where we have a defined three-way intersection here with Main Street we realign Ash Street to tee it up to the Market Basket driveway directly across from Bolton Street. So now we have a separate four-way intersection here, completely separate from the Main Street intersection, uh, controlling the Ash Street and Bolton Street approaches with stop signs. Um, we do uh, extend the sidewalk along Ash Street to connect to the driveway and then connect eventually to Main Street. So that provides pedestrian connectivity improvements um, and one drawback that this could have, Ash Street does experience higher traffic volumes throughout the course of the day than um, the Market Basket Driveway. However, Market Basket Driveway does experience higher traffic volumes during the PM peaks. So um, one thing that we wanna note is that in the future, if the Eastern Gateway redevelopment project is, you know, does push forward and is constructed, um, traffic volumes along Ash Street would be expected to increase pretty substantially. Um, so converting this to a stop controlled approach here could have some drawbacks as far as operations go. Uh, another drawback is some impacts to the MBTA parking and the MBTA lane here on the south side of the drive where my cursor is. Uh, and then in, in addition, we still have the two railroad crossings across Maine and one across Ash. And there's a very short distance between this stop line here on Ash and the railroad crossing. So we took a look at another option, 
Same idea with keeping the intersection point the same for Main Street. Shortens the pedestrian crossing, so you have that benefit. Um, this keeps Ash Street as the free flow approach and tees up the Market Basket Drive and converts that to a stop controlled approach. Uh, and so you have basically a separate three-way intersection with Bolton Street and the Market Basket Drive, and then a separate three-way with Ash and Main, uh, and then your intersection with Main Street. So again, create some more defined intersections with more defined vehicle conflicts and control. This option does provide a greater distance between the stop control, the stop line here and the railroad crossing. So vehicle queues backing into that railroad crossing is not as much of a concern under this option. However, you can see here, while this does provide some additional green space, we are proposing to close off that McDonald's drive here. Um, so while that doesn't provide some benefits, it will require some property owner negotiations um, to go to allow us to close that driveway. Um, and this does also allow us to maintain all the MBTA land and parking spaces here on the south side of the drive. So those were the shorter midterm improvements we looked at keeping the intersection point to Main Street the same. And then we started talking with the town and set, you know, tried to think of if we did move the intersection point with Main Street and Ash Street, where would we propose to realign Ash Street and how would that look? Um, so this option here is, I'll go through this relatively quick. We did look at a roundabout um, mainly because this Main Street is under Matthew, Matthew T. jurisdiction here. So any in, intersection reconstruction project that we move forward at this location, Matthew T. will require us to evaluate a roundabout here. No matter if it makes sense or not, we do need to show it on paper and uh, explain why or why not we're moving forward with it. And they'll obviously have some input as well. So we did look at that from a very conceptual point of view. And you can see property impacts are pretty substantial here. It does require a complete taking of the Jiffy Lube and Burger King parcels. Um, access to the properties on the west side of Main Street is pretty substantially impacted as well. Um, we, we do have an access road here with a leg leading to that access road off the roundabout. But you, know, you can see if you're trying to enter this car wash from the north here, trying to traverse the roundabout, make that sharp right turn and come around and up into the car wash would be very difficult. So there are those negative impacts to the property owners on the west side of Main Street here. Um, and then in addition to the Burger King and the Jiffy Lube parcels, um, the Reading Plaza uh, parking lot is also uh, experiences some impacts to the number of parking spaces and the site circulation as well. Um, so while it does provide some benefits to traffic operations, vehicle and pedestrian safety, um, it slows vehicle speeds down. Um, the impacts to the properties were just too substantial to ignore here. So we kind of drifted away from this uh, improvement a little bit and looked at some other options. One of which is what's shown here. Um, so this proposes to realign Ash Street south of its current intersection point up here at Maine and tease it up further south, um, directly across from the car wash driveway. Uh, so the reason why we chose this location and this alignment is mainly because this car wash driveway is one of the higher generators of traffic volumes that we see in this area on the west side. So when we wanted to intersect directly across from that location to consolidate this intersection into one single four-way intersection rather than having offset three-way intersections between that car wash driveway and Ash Street. Um, so that is a benefit and that is why we chose this location. Uh, however, it does obviously provide, um, have some negative drawbacks, one of the main ones being the uh, entire taking of the Jiffy Lube parcel here. Um, and that is pretty much the main drawback with this, this option. It does increase safety, you know, obviously the same impacts I went over with reducing vehicle conflict points, you now have two separate intersections. Um, and in addition, it could provide some traffic operation benefits as well as now instead of combining the traffic volumes along Ash and Market Basket at one intersection to Main Street, we now separate that into two intersection points. So we have so, you know, only the, intersect, uh, the volumes along Ash Street at this intersection here, and then only the volumes along Market Basket and Bolton Street at this intersection up here. So those would decrease the volumes at the intersection with Main Street and provide, um, it would be expected to provide better operations at this location. 
Uh, and in addition, we do remove the railroad crossing from Ash Street. We eliminate that entirely. So now there's only a single railroad crossing at Main Street here. Then we looked at another option. Um, basically what we did was we used the current driveway between the Jiffy Lube and Burger King parcels, use that area as our realignment of Ash Street. So a lot of the same benefits do apply here that I just went over. Um, however, this obviously, as you can see, does not require the taking of the Jiffy Lube parcel. It does maintain that property and it does maintain the one-way site circulation of that property there. It also maintains Burger King with some minor impacts, but we are able to keep site circulation and maintain most of the parking. Um, the one drawback would be um, that it does not create a four-way intersection with a car wash driveway and is displaced a little further south there. Um, so in the end, these were the two preferred long-term options that we arrived at at this location. Um, and then as Wing said, another corridor that we looked at as part of our study was the John Street corridor. Um, as this does provide another connection from downtown Reading to the Walkersville corridor, and part of uh, the deficiencies that are out there today, the main deficiency is the high num um, volumes of cut through traffic that this corridor experienced. You know, this is a residential corridor. The land use is primarily residential. Um, a lot of uh, side street intersections. Uh, and what we see is people basically cutting, you know, bypassing downtown Reading, the signalized intersections with Salem Street or Main Street and Pleasant Street, Main Street and Washington Street, and basically cutting through Salem Street onto John Street here to get to Walker's Brook and then eventually I-95. Uh, so we wanted to look at implementing some traffic calming measures along this corridor that would one, discourage cut through traffic, make it a little more uncomfortable for people to fly through this corridor, you know, slow people down, but also, you know, make it less of a fly through direct route uh, and, and try to reduce the number of cut through volumes. So some options here that we identified uh, were some turning restrictions during peak hours. Uh, so I think this is already implemented uh, at the intersections of Salem Street and Elliott Street and Manning Street. Uh, so something very similar could be done on John Street as well, completely eliminating cut through traffic um, during the peak hours. Uh, you could do raised intersections. One location we thought of was John Street and Pleasant Street. Uh, this was identified as a high crash location. Uh, so a raised intersection basically does exactly what it says, elevates the pavement elevation at the intersection slows vehicles down, increases safety, not just for vehicles, but pedestrians, bikes as well. Uh, if a full raised intersection wasn't constructed, you could just do a single raised crosswalk. Very similar idea and very similar benefits to what a raised intersection provides. Uh, and then in addition, uh, radar speed feedback signs could be just, um, installed along the corridor as well. These have been known and proven to reduce vehicle travel speeds in an area. Uh, and these options that we show here, it's not just, you know, you pick one and that's it. It's not one or the other. Uh, there, it could be a combination of any of these options implemented um, at the same time to uh, accomplish the goals that we're trying to do here to eliminate cut through traffic. So that is a very shortened down version of our uh, entire holistic study that we completed here. Uh, so some net Next steps that we that we will do, we will submit our deliverable to the town, including all of this information we went over with you folks tonight. Um, from that point, the town can use that information how they choose to kick off the implementation process. So you know, start some design process, um, identify funding sources that are out there through grants, you know, whatever the case may be, um, to help help the town fund some of these design improvements that could be implemented. Um, so I hope you folks enjoyed our presentation, and now we'd like to open the floor to your questions. Uh, we'd be happy to go back to any slide that you might have a question on or want to see again. Um, so the floor is yours. Board members, Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you for that presentation. That was quite detailed. Um, I have a question for, for Jason. Um, um, the road diet is great because we heard in our open space planning meetings that people are looking for safe bike access. And in addition, um, 
I'm speaking of uh, Walker's Brook and, and Main Street for the moment. Um, so we have a lot of new residential properties coming in down there. There should be, and hopefully we would encourage more bicycle and more pedestrian traffic. Um, so the concern I have, and I had a question along with this. So I understand that Washington is quite narrow and I don't, after living here for 24, 25 years, I don't see a lot of pedestrians walking along down there. And frankly, I know you said it was kind of low traffic, but it, but it's so narrow. I can imagine that it actually feels a lot more dangerous than it is. So the question I had, is it possible to, um, do you always need sidewalks on both sides of the road? What if you had sidewalk on one side of the road and you had well lit pedestrian cross and bicycle signals at both ends of that little stretch and then you could accommodate um, a, a safe bicycle lane on the other side. Is that is that allowable? Do, do towns and cities do that? And yes, actually, thank, thank you, Karen. Um, I had the same yeah. question too for, um, sorry, I'll just wrap this all together. So my other thought was that, because otherwise there's no connection between Maine and Walkersbrook. And then the other thought is too, to the, um, the area we're trying to redevelop where market basket is, you know, could that be an alternative? Like you didn't, you talked about maybe improve, pre, improved pedestrian access, but I didn't hear the bike lanes. So we have bike lanes on Maine and bike lanes on Walker Brook, but no connection. Is there any way we, we could connect those? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Karen. Uh, those are great ideas. And we did look into taking one of the sidewalks. You know, I wouldn't say that while the, the land use along Washington is mainly residential, as you said, so there's not really a great need to have sidewalk on both sides. So ideally, what, what we were looking into was taking one of those sidewalks. Um, so the issues with taking the sidewalk on the south side is that south side, the grass strip is aligned all the way through with utility poles. So if you take that sidewalk, you do need to relocate a pretty significant number of utility poles, which not to say it can't be done, and as we said for Walker's Brook, that could be a potential opportunity to move the overhead utilities underground, um, which is a costly improvement, but a lot of towns and cities have been looking into it and it is an option. Um, so not to say that, that that can't be done, it's just a costly and time, uh, very probably a time, um, a longer period than um, what, what we may prefer. However, you know that could be something that kicks off soon uh, and could be an option. Um, so that was on the south side. On the north side, the, the back of the sidewalk pretty much directly abuts the property lines and the frontage of those residential properties on the north side. So in taking that entire sidewalk, you know, we have 24 feet of roadway width now. That sidewalk on the north side with the grass strip is about eight feet total. So that'd give us 32, which could provide 11 foot lanes in each direction and then two five foot bike lanes, um, which gets the 32 foot width. But that puts the edge of the roadway directly at that property owner, that property line. Uh, so it would provide some, probably some, some impacts and potential takings to the frontage of those properties. Um, so again, not to say that couldn't be done. Um, it's just a drawback to that option and something we brought to the attention of the town um, not necessarily to deter them away from it, but you know, just to let them know. Um, so in the interim, like we said, if Walker's Brook say the bike lanes are installed prior to this project being ready to go, um, some sharrows could be striped just as a short term, you know, try to increase awareness, while hopefully the longer term plan would be to add some bike lanes. Um, and if the town chooses, as you said, you could do a connection from Main Street potentially you know, maybe to Ash Street and then through that Eastern Gateway District development. And if that connection is made to New Crossing Road, um, potentially implement some bike accommodations along that way to kind of create, you know, you not necessarily use the Washington Street corridor, but a creative connection through there. Um, so that could be done as well. That would just need to be coordinated through the town, um, the, the contractors and the, the, um, the property owners um, who, who are uh, heading those projects. Um, but that could be another potential option to accommodate bikes as well. Um, so yeah, all of those are very valid points and could be implemented. Uh, so thank you. Um, if I could ask a couple of questions. Um, I, I, so this is great in terms of getting the very high level in terms of what's going on. And I think after the board gives some feedback, um, Julie, Andrew, we'd love to kind of hear your perspective on uh, both 
what you would like from us and what next steps you're thinking. I found myself looking at it and saying, okay, we're, we're how do we think about priorities here? And I found myself saying, well, um, pedestrian safety first, <laughs> vehicle safety next. Um, and then following up on, on Karen's point, I think we should be thinking a lot about the Eastern Gateway potential as kind of part of the thinking. So that Ash Street um, may kind of move up in priority for a lot of reasons, uh, car traffic, pedestrian traffic. And one of the things that um, I, I know that we've talked a lot about at different meetings is that today, if people uh, want to come from the Market Basket Plaza or conceivably RMLD Plaza, they end up, they could end up walking along the railroad tracks or in the railroad basin. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> and just to make sure that our thinking is kind of is looking at that as a possibility. Clearly, you know, we're not gonna be able to do every single thing all at once. But just for the planning point of view, to, to be thinking that those are potentials, how do we connect that? I love the idea of kind of you have that overview, which is kind of Main Street to Walker's Brook to the lake. And then just to make sure that the Eastern Gateway and how we're thinking about that would have the same kind of connect, connected potential. Um, because you know we do have, Karen, you, you hit a spot on. We got lots of new residential stuff going on. We want people to be able to safely move back and forth to get down to Market Basket Plaza, wherever they want to get to by, by foot, by bike, however. And each of these other development areas, I'd love to kind of see that, um, that happen. Um, general comments, I found in um, a lot of the things where you showed multiple alternatives, when you showed kind of an alternative two, I'm not sure why, but I tended to find those better. <laughs> uh, not sure why, but those, it was kind of helpful to think about that. Um, one of the things I think about on Main Street, um, and, and it may just be I'm not understanding it completely, but um, we already know that we have um, traffic issues. And so we, we have bagel well traffic issues, we have car wash traffic issues, kind of all those pieces. The flows that seem to be right across from the car wash struck me as really problematic as people trying to like jump across Main Street into the car wash. That didn't feel good at all. Um, so I, I don't know if that's, maybe I'm not reading it correctly, but I think that's one of the things we'd want to consider there as well. It's a very high traffic uh, area. Um, I don't know if you, if that's one of the areas you looked at also in terms of traffic going by there, but they try to control flow. You can only leave by taking a right. You're not supposed to go in by taking a left. And, and that, you know, sometimes people obey that and sometimes they don't. Um, so anyway, that was a lot of kind of jumbled stuff. Um, I found this is a lot to process and I, I, I had read it first and then you guys presented it and, and great, very helpful. I'm still kind of processing it. So that, that's where I am. Other board members. Vanessa. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, Jason Wayne, thank you so much for the presentation and, and for all the staff who contributed here. Um, there is one thing I wanted to raise um, as far as these corridors and how we talk about them. Um, while it may not seem like there's a lot of heavy pedestrian access, the pedestrian access um, is absolutely critical and necessary. There are um, people in our community that don't drive and maintaining those corridors and having them be safe for pedestrians to me is a top priority in these areas. Um, so that's just item one. And the second is, you know, all of these are, you know, wonderful, great creative solutions. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is what's the price tag for these? Um, some of these are sort of low hanging fruit, stop signs, um, and that's great, but I'm hearing millions of dollars here um, for some of these proposals. And, and I'll be honest, that makes me a little nervous. Um, so I, I don't know who potentially would want to address that. Mark's point is, is a lot to process, but I just, all of these would be great improvements. I don't see how we can afford them. I, I guess I can take a step at it. Um, so as, as uh, Mark mentioned, you know, there are a lot of locations and I think one of the, the, the better suggestions is to maybe prioritize which ones to go with and then we can kind of focus on what would be the cost for that um, particular improvement. I think if, if the town has a consensus on the improvements, then we can start grouping them in terms of priorities and then plan them out that way. Um, you know, uh, the reality is we probably won't be able to make all the improvements at once, but if we can identify priorities, then identify funding possibilities, 
uh, then we can kind of put them in order and have a sort of a long-term plan and schedule, if you will, um, and try to slowly implement one at a time. Can I ask one kind of ancillary question to that? Um, so Route 28 is a state road. Does the town own the traffic signals? Is that our responsibility? So I believe, and Jason, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Mass DOT owns, uh, I think they own up to the railroad. And then anything north of that, it is town that's, owned. Okay, that's the signal. Uh, at Main Street and, and uh, Washington is town owned and maintained. Got it. Okay, thank you. Other board members? And, um, oh, Vanessa, sorry. I will piggyback to that. Um, what the price tags, and we're very early to talk price now. You know, this is a very conceptual study, but um, there are a number of grants out there that could be implemented for this work as well. Um, you know, Mass DOT has a complete streets program that's out there that can award municipalities up to $400,000 a year for construction funds, um, which, you know, obviously the, the, um, the concepts that we went over tonight do fall under those eligible action items under that program. So, you know, that's one of many um, that could be used to help supplement some funds here uh, to make these projects a reality. Um, so that, that's another option as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as far as, you know, next steps and prioritizing, I mean, to me, identifying what the potential likelihood is of securing funding for outside funding for these um, is going to need to be at the top of the list because without it, we can have all the wonderful presentations in the world if we have no way of paying for them. It's, yep. it's a fun discussion. Agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, only thing I, I, I want to add on that, Vanessa, I completely agree. I think that the pedestrian safety kinds of issues that we've talked about, and, and I think we're in violent agreement about this, um, to me, may get kind of higher priority than others to start. And, and obviously, we've got to figure out how to pay for them. Absolutely. But I think about the new residential stuff that Karen brought up. I think about connecting train, Walker's Brook, um, all those new pieces and the pedestrian side of those are the ones that I think are the most, I mean, personally, are, are really, really important to think through. Fully agree, Mark. Mm -hmm. Other board questions, comments? So a uh, question for the board. I think that we may have Mike and Nora Flynn um, who are kind of residents uh, and, and abutters, uh, I guess, to the Eaton Street area in particular. I don't know if they're on or if they might have a comment, um, but if it's all right with the board, would, would that be all right to ask them to speak? Vanessa? Yeah, I have a question before we jump to them, if that's okay, Mark. Um, sure. From the next steps perspective, um, as far as Jason and Wing are concerned, I, I understand um, some of the cost of the consultant was covered by the Eaton Lakeview developers as part of a um, earlier discussion. But um, what are the next steps here with the consultants? Um, that's something we haven't really talked with Julie and Andrew about yet. Um, I know we own yeah. the deliverable, which is uh, basically a whole summary of, uh, of what we presented here today, along with all the back of materials. But uh, no, we have not um, really talked about the next steps yet. Um, but it, you know, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll cross that bridge maybe after this meeting and, and kind of hammer that out. So as far as the scope of the project, this is now completed. I'm, I'm assuming there's a longer report, obviously. Um, but for purposes of this discussion, this project has, this is now the last step, correct? Essentially, yes. Okay, thank you. Bob. Just to follow up um, on Vanessa's comments, um, the work that's been done here was um, part and parcel of the Eaton Lakeview project. Uh, the neighbors had a lot of concerns with traffic flow, with safety. And, um, you know, the town uh, and the developer, I think we split it about two thirds, one third with the town paying two thirds, agreed to do this work um, uh, rather than some of the things that were suggested, you know, a, a red light here, change this intersection. This is a much more holistic study. So 
So that was part of CPDC's discussion, I believe, with, um, with the neighborhood. Um, so uh, if it's all right with the board, uh, would we uh, let Mike and, and Nora Flynn uh, add a couple of comments? Great, Mike and Nora, are, are you there? Were you able to, to hang in with us? If so, you're muted. Are you guys able to unmute? I think you're you're on by phone. Are you able to unmute your phone? There you go. Hey guys, oh. sorry, I was watching by YouTube and I heard my name mentioned. <laughs> you know, it, it was a lot of information. I, I think I would just echo what Bob just said. I, I think, um, you know, ultimately, you know, this was uh, a lot of this was brought on from the Eaton Lakeview project. Um, a lot of concerns that the the residents have brought up. Um, you know, I, 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 think, I think you guys have asked good questions and, and had a, a lot of good discussion. I mean, ultimately, I, I thought, Vanessa and Mark, your, your comments about, um, you know, this is all great to show, but ultimately, how do we, you know, if this is something we want, how do we execute, you know, and, and set priorities, I think, is an important aspect. But, but I think what I heard is having this prepared and having ideas of what our priorities are and funding are uh, just open the door when grants or money or new opportunities come up. So I think it is important to, to push this type of study and issues and, and understanding our priorities because this is how we, we find alternative funding sources beyond just what the, the town can afford. So, um, you know, it, it was a lot, um, but it was a lot of good information. So, you know, I, glad they were able to present it I, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak <laughs> oh thanks for joining Mike I heard Mike Flynn I wasn't I didn't know it was you but great yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you mentioned that also so Vanessa and I last year seems like last decade but it was last year we got to go to the MMA and one of the presentations that was out there was I think the is it smart streets is that one of the programs that we talked about as a potential funding source and I went to one of the sessions where um I think it, was a, it may have been a planner from, from a particular city, talked about how they had been able to do just kind of project after project after project um, in getting those funds and, um, you know, ideas like that. And, and, you know, I'm sure you guys are all over that, but I think that's, that's a great idea. And particularly where it's kind of connecting pieces and, you know, we do have a lot going on and to, to connect it safely would be wonderful. And I'm not at all deaf to, to traffic issues. I just, I, I feel like, um, when I look at it, you know, crossing Washington Street, you know, anybody that's trying to go, you know, even down, if you're trying to walk to, to Bagel World, that's, that's exciting. Um, there's just a lot of things that I think we really should work on as, as high priorities and figure out if we can get it funded or partially funded. Any other questions or comments, board members? Um, Ju oh, sorry, Vanessa. Sorry, I have you on the corner here. Sorry. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, I guess I would ask uh, of the staff for our next steps, um, less so for, for Jason and Wing, um, but to prioritize what they see um, are the you know sort of immediate needs for this. Um, so my preference would be a focus on pedestrian safety um, and have estimated dollar amount attached to it. I think that it is really challenging to talk about priorities without understanding the cost implication of it. Um, so as far as, you know, my guidance to staff, those would be the two things I would be looking for um, and would very much appreciate you know, their particular insight on how to proceed. Thank you. Um, Andrew and Julie, are there particular things that you guys are seeing here um, in terms of your prioritizing or other things that you want to share with us or that you would like to get from us? So um, I'll just chime in really quickly and then Andrew and also Aaron are here and might have some additional comments, but um, the feedback that you've given has been really good. I think that, you know, we've had a number of meetings internally with the Parking Traffic Transportation Task Force where we've reviewed um, Green International's work, you know, across the past couple of years and kind of given feedback as they've gone. 
um, and we've tried to improve the neighborhood as much as we could. And um, we are always and currently working with property owners in that Eastern Gateway area to, to kind of tie these different redevelopment concepts together. So we're looking at the area, like again, more holistically than just like one piece at a time. Um, so I think that, you know, from our standpoint, we would take your feedback tonight and kind of look back at what Green International has presented and, and whether any changes to what they've shown us are warranted, and then talk internally about how we might prioritize, um, like you guys have asked us to do, and based on you know some of the things you've said, like pedestrian safety. And then I do think that the intersection, the General Way, um, Blockers Brook Drive, Lakeview Avenue intersection will probably end up a little bit higher on the priority list if, if possible since that was the genesis of this um, study. Um, but you know, I can't speak for, for everyone who's involved in this process and, and whether that would actually um, you know, be in the short, mid or longer term um, as it, in terms of cost and how it plays out with everything else that we're considering here. Um, but I, I think that you know, we could also con continue to explore the grants that are available um, there are many different types of grants beyond just complete streets grants. There are masters grants. There's um, housing choice grants. There's all sorts of grants, and we're, we we do as staff like to apply for grants when we can. So you know it would be a large coordinated staff effort. Um, what you've seen tonight is really conceptual. So like Wing and Jason mentioned, you know we need to look into getting into design development um, and you know the process with with applying for grants and the design development and all that would include a lot more um, sort of uh, information sessions with the public, information sessions to do, so feedback gathering. Um, so this is, it feels like we've been doing this for three years because we have, um, but this is the beginning of a pretty lengthy process ahead of us. So. Andrew, do you want to add to that? No, I think she hit the nail on the head and summarized pretty nicely everything. Um, we started housing choice a few years ago, which led to the Eastern Gateway study. So piggybacking off of that is always potential for future grant opportunities between housing choice and others. So uh, I think we've lined ourselves up quite, quite nicely with the plans that we've put forward. And if we push forward even more, then like Julie mentioned, more public outreach, more relationship building with private owners will be done and that will be extremely helpful. Awesome. Um, any last time, Bob? Um, thanks, Mark. It does, seem, it does feel like a long time, but a few years back, um, I met with our state delegation and uh, the MassWorks grants in particular were uh, recommended to us uh, because at the time, at least, they came in three to five million dollar chunks and were very much aimed at economic development. So from that standpoint, uh, connectivity or linkage from the downtown to Walker's Brook was key. Um, and then as you look at some of the safety issues, generally speaking, uh, they're less expensive and there'd be different sets of grants that would cover those. So that's we've kind of spanned the, uh, the world of grants, as it were, and try to apply them you know, where they're most helpful. But, you know, the comment I, I remember getting from one of our reps uh, years ago is when I think said, do you think we could make uh, an application for one or two million? He said, you're not going to want to apply for anything less than five million. That's the size that those grants travel in. And if you're going to really consider serious economic development, you're going to need that. So, you know, I agree with Vanessa's comments, especially whatever this costs, we don't possibly have the money to do it all or, or even very much of it ourselves. Um, you know, we're gonna have to work with the state. We're gonna have to work with um, other developers that may wanna come in or landowners, um, you know, then, and we have continued to talk to them quite a, quite a bit. So this really is a snapshot and kind of an early look um, at some things that could happen coming down the road. And it's really helpful for the board to make comments. That was the point of tonight was for you to react to what you see to help guide kind of staff as to where to go next. Awesome. Carlo, did I see you had a comment? Well, I've just been listening. This is very similar to the Birch Meadow uh, complex and how many years did it take to get to a, you know, rest, a restroom pavilion and a, and a main spine path. But the, this, I live in this area and 
there's a lot of high pedestrian use at Washington and Main and along Main Street by McDonald's into Market Basket. So that would be my priority if I had to pick one today. Uh, but I know this is a long term view, but anything we can do to improve pedestrian safety and more lights, more private walkways, raised walkways, whatever we can do. Obviously, those are you know less costly, but I agree. The connectivity and how to get the Walkers Brook cutting through the Market Basket down by the railroad tracks is, would be uh, very nice. Um, as we get more buildings and more people, uh, this area is very, very, very highly used um, throughout the day and into the early evening. Not so much at night, but um, again five to ten year plan here at least but money is going to be key just like what what can we do you know what's impact versus the money what do we get that biggest bang for the buck so um like bob said some things would be less costly but uh, my focus would be on ash street maine and washington that area for pedestrian safety and uh, and to connect over to walker's brook so it was a nice presentation a lot to absorb and uh, a lot of options. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Um, Aaron, I realized I didn't give you the option to, to chime in. Why don't, why don't we do that for a minute? <laughs> sure. From my perspective, I'm really excited about all the opportunities. Um, it would be helpful, and I'm learning more as you are all continuing to provide your comments. Super helpful. I, I would love to understand um, in more detail what certain priorities are of, of the board and specific locations. Um, I, that's super helpful um, because looking forward in our next steps, we could obviously there's a visioning process and continued planning efforts, but to be competitive for grant funds, we need to really be set up um, and have gone through some significant planning um, and some pre-construction um, kinds of details. Um, so any additional details that can be provided um, through this through this process tonight and um, future um, outreach is, is incredibly helpful so we can focus and fine tune um, both the funding opportunities and also just um, putting different pieces together. Um, this kind of work is, is more than funding. Uh, it's funding and active negotiations with multiple stakeholders, and sometimes those stakeholders are at the state, sometimes they're regional, sometimes they're multiple property owners. Um, so um, this work is incredibly complicated and complex. Um, so more uh, as much guidance as possible is really helpful in terms of prioritization, so we know um, what we're kind of needing to set up, if you will. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we're good. Thanks, folks. Very much appreciated. Oh, I'm sorry, Vanessa, go ahead. Sorry, um, just one more thing. Um, it would be great. I mean, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about potential grants. Um, it would be nice as we talk about this um, in next steps to know what grants, what grants are available in what quantities and what our likelihood of getting them is. We know some are more achievable than others. Um, so making that part of the presentation would be helpful as well. Thanks. Good idea. I would like to add uh, to that comment too, again, there are lots of different types of grants um, that can be used in, for a variety of pieces of funding. So it could be roadways, it could be culverts, it, you know, there's a level of detail that's also needed to be able to um, give, give a certain level of um, understanding of what uh, grants could be utilized depending on what the project type is. So um, there are many grants out there and we can certainly provide some level of information, but uh, again, details are needed on particular projects um, to do a deeper dive. Cool, all right. Thank you folks. Thanks very much for, for the presentation, for the discussion and um, look forward to the next step. Thank you for having us. You bet. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is um, VASC. Um, so you folks have a, you made a recommendation that's in the packet. Um, board members, do you want to 
Is there any discussion you want to have on on those? Any questions about what what the vast presented? In this situation, the VASC is Vanessa and Carlo, correct? Right. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Um, Karen. So I would need to recuse myself from for the ATROC. Are you going to do these all at once? In which case, I recuse myself for all of them, or if you're going to do them one at a time, um, however you'd like. Um, so you really only need to recuse yourself from one of them. So I think maybe what we should do is we can take all but all but that one and then that one. Why don't we do that? Okay. Um, but board members, are you comfortable? I mean, I've got, um, Caitlin gave me a motion that has the information here. Do you want me to put that up? Why don't I do that? So here's, here is the, these are the recommendations if we have it correctly. <laughs> and what I propose is that we would, uh, do um, the first four as a motion, and then we can all vote on that. And when we would do the fifth one where Karen would recuse herself. Is that all right with all? Okay, Carlo, can I ask you to read the motion that includes the first four bullets, yeah. please? Sure. Move to appoint Linda Harrison for a full membership on CPDC term expiring June 30th, 2021. Move to appoint Alex Normandon for an associate membership on ZBA, term expiring June 30th, 2021. Move to appoint Chris Emilius for an associate membership on ZBA, term expiring June 30th, 2021. Move to appoint Ashley Gross for a full membership on ETRAC, term expiring June 30th, 2021. Thanks, Carla. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Any discussion on these folks? I just wanted to comment that as I looked through the packet and looked at the um, the folks that applied, I was unbelievably impressed um, with the folks. Uh, the, the, you know, first of all, we had a bunch of folks and their credentials. It was it was it was great to see. So, um, and it's great that you guys came to quick consensus, or, or I don't know if it was quick consensus. Consensus. <laughs> um, any other comments? Yeah. Um, just would encourage folks to continue to apply. Um, as there will no doubt be um, more openings coming soon um, for various positions, and we very much appreciate um, our town volunteers. Absolutely, great, great point. Thanks. Um, no discussion appearing, so we will take a vote on on this motion. As I see you folks on the screen, so Karen. Yes. Hello. Yes. Ann? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. And Mark, yes. Okay, Carlo, can I ask you to read the um, the fifth one only here, please? Does Karen need to officially recuse herself now? I'm sure he did. Oh, you're on you're on mute, Karen. Oh, Sorry, she's gone. I was wondering why you guys weren't hearing me. Now I get it. I'm recused. I'm recusing myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Carlo. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> okay, please. All right, move to appoint Madeline Herrick for an associate uh, associate membership on ATRAC term expiring June 30th, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vanessa. Any discussion? And appearing, let's take a vote. Um, Carlo? Yes. Vanessa? Oh, you're on mute still. Still on mute. Space bar is failing me. Yes. <laughs> and yes. And Mark, yes. We are four four zero on this one. That's great. Can someone uh, invite Karen back to the meeting if you're not hearing us? I'm not sure if you are or not. I'll ping her. Oh, there she is. Hi, Karen. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sorry, going next. I think we're on communications policy. Is that where we are? Um, is it one of those? Yeah, select board communications policy. Um, Anne, can I turn it over to you? Yeah. Um, so this will actually um, blend and fold into the next agenda item, um, given one portion of the of the communication po communications policy deals with um, our public records policy, actually. 
um, which so we may want to defer on adopting that portion of the um, of the communications policy, depending on what, on the feeling of the board. But I had occasion to um, to make some to, to uh, receive edits from Ivria um, and comments, and then to go through them with her last Monday, um, and then I made some uh, updated edits based on that conversation, which I can walk. Uh, through with you now. Um, so uh, in brief, um, you know, Ivria had suggested we just use um, the term town matters instead of town business, um, which mirrors the state's ethics law terminology. Um, Ivria also cautioned, and I wanted to share with all of you that um, in using the the town seal and the town stationery for communications. Um, we have to be very cautious not to use it to further private interests. And that can even include um, concerns that are public spirited in, nat in nature um, if there are individual concerns of public employees. So uh, I asked Ivria for an example on that. And um, if uh, a if a resident calls us with a particular concern that falls within the jurisdiction of the of the select board, it would be fine for us to respond or acknowledge that on stationary. Um, but if someone asked us for a letter of recommendation, that is not something that would that we can use the town stationary for. Um, but it's something to, to keep in mind um, as we begin to use stationary. So, and so I apologize, I cut out, I cut out there just for a second. So the, the point, the example of what we cannot use the stationary for, can you just repeat that? Uh, for example, uh, writing a letter of recommendation on behalf of a resident. Great, really thank focus you. focus on town business only, just to be clear, not personal. Right, and, he, and I was, you know, even if it's public spirited in nature, if it's an individual, um, if it's if it's furthering an, an individual interest, even if it's public spirited in nature, that um, that does not um, pass muster. So, okay. um, I spoke with Ivria. Ivria had asked about, you know, what if. Uh, you know, we had we had set our our set of exceptions for when an email would not appear in the pa packet, um, and Ivria had asked, you know, what if the matter is highly sensitive, or the individual asks for the email to be withheld? What if it falls within one of the other exemptions to the public records law? I had mentioned to her we'd had this conversation at one of our previous meetings, and that the board felt we didn't want to overwrite the policy, but that the existing language, we kind of understood that there would be exceptions um, that, and, and that that is an understanding uh, that there will be exceptions that come up and, you know, working with, with town council, um, those, those exceptions can be made. Um, you know, one, I'm, I'm remembering now too, she did approve or, or take a look at my last draft, but I'm remembering now one um, piece of the conversation with her. She said, you may want to write into the policy um, who is responsible for making that ultimate determination, you know, whether it's the chair um, that, so we could, you know, in terms of what is withheld from, from the packet um, with the, you know, bearing in mind the policy. Do we want to make that the call of the chair? I think for simplicity, it probably makes sense. Otherwise, um, we don't want, I think we don't want to have a meeting every time there's a question. I, I also think though, as you described exceptions, um, exceptions should be exceptions, meaning that they don't often happen. Um, they'll be occasional in nature and, and be reviewed, but I think the expectation that we talked about was, you know, unless it meets one of those specific criteria, 
it, it gets published, um, as I think we do now. And I'm, I, I don't think we've had nearly a problem. I don't think I'm familiar with a problem we've had with that to date. Vanessa? I think we might be overthinking it, um, but I also think, you know, I, I agree with listing those few exceptions. Um, the idea of empowering a chair to make decisions about things like that, um, you know, policies I think should reflect um, many various circumstances, not and, and future boards, not necessarily um, who we are now. Uh, I think if we're prescriptive to the very narrow things that, you know, to Mark's point, I'm comfortable with that. Um, you know, the, the role of the chair is really meant to be administrative um, to help meetings run more efficiently. So giving them sort of powers beyond that makes me a little uncomfortable. Other thoughts? Then who do you think should decide, you know, makes the judgment call based on the policy as to what goes in the packet? Is it Caitlin? It's probably not fair to Caitlin <laughs> to have to make those kind of judgment calls. I'm sure she'll politely say no, thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I think those are the, I, I'd have to, Mark or, or Bob, could you, do you mind putting it on the screen, that particular section? I mean, I think if I remember correctly, they were pretty specific. Do you remember the exact number? There, there, I, I wouldn't, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of room for interpretation, correct? The correspondence is from or pertains to a minor child. The correspondence involves privileged legal material or otherwise on the advice of town council. Yeah, I mean, the, the first one happens rarely. Um, and the second two involve legal counsel. So I guess it's legal counsel's decision. So if there's a question that it's not really up to the chair or even the town manager, um, the question, if there is something that falls into one of those two categories, then it's town council's sort of judgment call. And really, I just don't see this coming up all that often. Yeah, I feel like, <laughs> so like I said, we might be overthinking it. <laughs> I feel like we are. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm comfortable with it as is. I, I don't think we need to prescribe every sort of uh, variation that can happen. I, I'm comfortable with it as is. Okay. All right. Um, Um, Ivria makes some comments, you know, cautioning us about distribu distributions of documents, you know, um, and making sure that in such distribution, the open meeting law is not violated. Um, now, and the, the last piece um, is this Act 1.4.2, um, which Jackie actually referenced earlier in the meeting, is this access uh, to public records provision within our communications policy. Um, Ivria said it's not necessary um, because the open meeting, or not, excuse me, not the open meeting law, the public records law already um, designates um, uh, the town clerk for this, for this role um, as, the, as the custodian of public records, but that, you know, this is fine um, and we should, you know, be sure that it's also uh, Laura Jen's policy as well. Um, I don't know based on the fact that this is an agenda item coming up and the comments that we've received so far, if we want to hold on adopting this last piece of the policy, if, there, if um, folks are looking for more specificity, um, but the only change uh, I believe that I had made um, to the existing policy was to take public records out of quotes. So 
system. So I, um, this is the next agenda item, but, but the next agenda item is to kind of get the board's flavor on um, a suggested policy that is much more specific than 1.4.2. 1.4.2 doesn't really, um, doesn't really talk about what the board has seen as a, as a requested policy. I mean, this is kind of generic saying, you know, okay, this is how it's gonna work and who's got responsibility. The other is more talking about what, uh, what should be uh, available. So I, I'd be comfortable either including this as is, knowing that we're probably gonna to add to it or doing everything except this piece where Ivria said it's not technically necessary to have it right now. I have a procedural question. Please. Um, if, we, uh, if we include it now, are we going to need to have another hearing when we change that portion of the policy? Or are we gonna have to have sort of two separate hearings to review it? Mm -hmm. um, no, because you don't need a hearing to make these changes. Okay, then I'm fine with either arrangement. Have a preference, and do you have a preference on, on how you'd rather do it? I don't have. I don't have. I think this language is not problematic, but I don't think it goes to you know the concerns that members of the public have raised um, in terms of. I mean, the law is a law in terms of what has to be provided with respect to public records. There's a. It's a separate question, which is not really a public records question, but a. a I don't know, a transparency question about what you make proactively available, kind of like what we're doing here with, we provide way more than is legally necessary in our packets, for example. There's no requirement to have a packet at all under open meeting law or public records law. We put a ton of information out there uh, every week. So that's, um, that's, I think, more the kind of thing that residents are looking for. Um, versus, you know, make sure you're complying with the public records law and um, are philosophically in agreement with the public, fulfilling your obligations of the public records law, which is what this, this policy currently says. Vanessa. I suggest we just leave it in. We don't have an alternative yet, so it doesn't do any harm. Um, I think if we were to remove it, that there, that might raise questions if we don't immediately replace it with something. So, if Ivra doesn't have any objections and 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 you don't use and 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 you don't either, um, I'd be inclined just to leave it. That's fine. That's fine. One other piece I just wanted to draw your attention to because I had made some edits and I think for me this is an important section and I did have a conversation with Ivria about it um, and, and you do you will see some updates from the last conversation it's um, it's 5d uh, and I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of if an inquiry I'll, I'll just read the read the paragraph um, if an inquiry relates to interaction with a member of town staff, the town manager shall provide all relevant updates to the board as permitted by law or pursuant to the advice of town council. The town manager, the ombudsman, and the human resource resources director shall make themselves available to the public as may be helpful for further follow-up on the inquiry, provided, however, that the town manager, the ombudsman, and the human resources director shall not provide substantive responses to such inquiries when doing so would violate a contract or other law and need not so respond when such response would be contrary to the advice of town council. So I think this is an important um, part of our policy. And I think it's one where, you know, it's, I, it's important for the board and the town manager to be on the same page. So I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to it. Um, it's, it's similar to that, to the same, to the language that I previously presented, um, except with that kind of provided however language tacked to the end. So, so uh, I guess one part of the question, Bob, 
you're are you okay with this uh, as written? Yeah, I hadn't seen the addition until it went in the packet, but it certainly makes sense to me. And if Ann and Avria worked on it, I'm fine with it. I'm just reading it one more time here. Yeah. You want me to share it, Mark? Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to get onto a page, though. <laughs> it cuts across. You want me to um, just show it as it's reworded without all this uh, graphics? Sure, that's fine from my perspective. I don't know if others what others would find most helpful. Let's just show it this way. Yeah. Can you also make it a little bit bigger, Bob? Sure. I'm fine with it. So question on that last sentence, um, the, the last portion, and need not still respond when such response would be contrary to the advice of town council. Mm -hmm. um, there's it's potentially problematic there. Um, and I don't quite know how to fix this. I, I would defer to Anne, but um, you know, a lot of our communication to policy talks about closing the loop. Right. So what I would want to make sure is that if, and, and we've seen this where a resident reaches out and they have a concern that's been raised um, and then they never hear back from anyone. Um, now there's an understanding that obviously um, personnel matters cannot be discussed publicly and, and rightly so, um, but there needs to be a way to close the loop as well without necessarily disclosing any information. So when I when I wrote the so respond, that's supposed to mean substantively. Um, I don't think it's, we can, I think, and this is, I believe consistent with my conversation with every, I don't think there would be a problem um, with there being an you know, requiring an acknowledgement, um, provide, you know, there can't be a substantive response if it's contrary to the advice of town council, but, um, and, you know, providing yeah. an acknowledgement, I think, or requiring an acknowledgement, I think is, is fine. Yeah, I, I'd love to see some language regarding requiring an acknowledgement, um, but not necessarily have it be, um, inclusive of, of substance that could be problematic. I'll, I'll leave the legal language to you though. <laughs> um, I think you could say um, in that, like the starting the line third from the bottom, um, shall provide an acknowledgement, but shall not provide substance responses that's perfect works for me as well karen carlo good yeah that's good okay karen that went all right with you as well question sorry blame it on the cat um so question um uh, to vanessa's point about closing the loop um I can think of an example where um, a resident may have received an acknowledgement, but not something substantive. Yeah, it's really late. I'm going to have a hard time speaking English. <laughs> so we're not covering that. There's no time period here. There's no, so I, I still think there's some closing the loop issues and I don't know that we're addressing everything here. That's the only challenge I see with that. And it's, it's really, you know, thank you Vanessa for bringing that to our attention. Are you thinking it would be helpful to have some kind of timeline around the acknowledgement? Um, 
Yeah, well, I would say, as our secretary does, um, respond, there's an acknowledgement in a timely manner. So mm -hmm. that's good. And then, but the substance that follows up, how do we close the loop on that? How do we make sure those things, the real answer and the real information goes back? So this is not with respect to you're we're not talking anymore about the um the interaction with town staff issue specifically i actually am okay um so well we've talked about how there in certain situations there can't be a substantive acknowledgement or a substantive response Maybe we need to go up a little bit to where you can have a substantive response. Oh, okay. Um, so it's either through email or at the next select board meeting that we're supposed to re um, receive an update um, on, on issues. Yeah. Um, so there's an, you know, and then the town manager shall maintain a record of outstanding requests and inquiries okay. that are worth okay. attention. That's it. So, that makes, um, so by the next meeting, if we have to, if the answer has to be, we can't answer this, cannot address this, then that's an answer or it's, it's more, there's more substance by the following meeting. We should, we, the town manager would be providing us um, an update, a status report on outstanding, um, outstanding issues as part of the um, town manager report at each meeting. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and then the next paragraph um, is more specific about inqu inquiries relating to interaction with town staff. Um, and so, yes, we're supposed to to be, receive all relevant updates that are permitted by law and that can come in the town manager's report. Um, and then for additional follow-up inquiries from board members, from members of the public, the town manager, ombudsman and human resources director shall make themselves available. Um, but if it's, you know, they shall make themselves available, provide an acknowledgement of such an inquiry. Um, but if they, for legal reasons can't provide a substantive update, they shall not do so. Okay, but we're gonna like let, there'll be like, there'll be an acknowledgement that can't give you an update for legal reasons, right? So what I'm trying to avoid is the, someone sends in, someone sends requests and it just never gets responded to ever. And it could be by accident. It, it, it probably is by accident, it gets buried. It's the it's the close the loop um, part that I'm concerned about. So there should be some acknowledgement in the town manager's report, but then for like these additional and 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 we do limit it by you know what is permitted by law or pers pursuant to the advice of town council. So the, and that sh that should come you know at the next board meeting. And then the, the follow up from there is if it isn't resolved or can't be resolved in that time frame, it gets onto this list, the follow up list. And um, it kind of just it doesn't say what happens after that. It kind of says it's on the list. Here's what it's going to contain um, as part of the time, which will be and the list will be provided to the board as part of the time manager's report at each meeting. So I, I think what that's meaning, I'm interpreting it to mean that when there's an update on that item, it needs to be updated on that list and brought forward. Is that how other people are reading? So there might not always be an update available. Yes. And there is. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so to Karen's point on, um, so we kind of said, okay, there's this, this tracking list, and then we just want to make sure that things are getting knocked off the list and completed. So it doesn't actually say that, but that's, I think that's, that's what I think we were thinking. I do think there's some responsibility on the board, you know, to sort of react and, you know, react, okay, here's where things stand. You know, if we feel like um, it merits some additional attention, we can indicate that. 
So we kind of would ask at the meeting, you know, can can you provide an update on this item, a further update, I guess, for the next meeting? Is that how people are envisioning it? I mean, I think anything that where the loop isn't closed, it's gonna it should appear on that list until the loop is closed. And then it's on us as, as board members if there are items that that haven't been resolved or there are more, uh, you know, multiple requests on the same topic, more people are talking about it. I'm sure that, that Bob's going to want to close it, but if for some reason we're not, you know, we're looking for something else, then we, it's kind of on us to bring that up. So the the record should be of outstanding resident requests. So, so to me, that means resident requests where the loop has not been closed. I, I agree with Mark. A, a lot of the onus is on us uh, on bringing this up with Bob or, or whomever. I mean, we want to avoid what happened two weeks ago, and you know, and that because of frustration and follow up and falling through the cracks, whatever it may be. But I think if if, if one of us or a few of us want to bring something to light, then then we should do so. It's just the manner in which we do it. So I think the onus is always on us, and we have to, you know, adhere to the residents on their requests. But we have to do it in a way that is respectful, and uh, it can be done out in public. So, you know, if if we if we want something addressed, we do it here. We do it through an email, and then if it's something that's not getting resolved, we can bring it up again. But I, I don't think we need to, you know beat someone up over it, but I think we have to just address it and whether it's the five of us together or two of us or three of us, then that's how we do it. I, I agree, closing the loop has been a big problem, um, but there's a certain way to do it. So, but I, I agree with Mark, we have to own it um, if we're the one who brought it forward and then we just try to get it done as quickly as possible. I think probably it's going to be Bob's desire to get these things off the list as quickly as they possibly can be. <laughs> um, but to the extent that that they're not, then then I think we we bring it back up. And that's how it goes. Vanessa. Um, respectfully to Carlos' comment, I don't think the onus is on us. We are five volunteers who attempt to address a significant number of town issues um, in our spare time. We rely very heavily on the staff to stay on top of issues that we bring to their attention. Um, it's, it's quite literally their job. Um, so I think that there needs to be an understanding that it cannot be on five volunteers to continuously ensure that the tasks are getting done. Um, our job is not to maintain these lists. Our job is to look at policy. Our job is to look forward, is to look at capital projects. Um, and we can't do that if we are sort of micromanaging the town manager and the staff. Um, so I am in favor of um, however the, the policy is best written um, to indicate that that responsibility needs to remain with the staff. It's not micromanaging. It's if, if we're bringing something up to Bob and we want to see it through, then that's what I mean. The onus is on us. If we, if we drop the ball, we can't blame Bob or town staff. Maybe I, maybe I misstated myself. That's what I meant. If we're bringing this forward, then we have to see it through. So right now I'm seeing that a little and, differently. And it through, we see it through by raising it with the town manager, other staff, and then relying on them um, to do the necessary work between meetings. And yes, absolutely. I mean, we, we all forget things. I don't think it's a matter of, um, you know, beating anyone up over things, but um, setting the expectations that, that the volunteers have to, um, you know, maintain our own list just so that we can double check that things get done. I mean, I, I think that's unrealistic and, and not necessarily a good use of our time. 
So I, I don't think anyone's suggesting a different list. I think what we're suggesting is that this is the guiding list that helps to close the loop and it should be getting closed. Items should be closed on a very regular basis. Right. If for and some reason an item isn't closed, then it needs to have kind of a method to carry it further forward. I, I, that, that's where I'm coming from. When I think when I'm thinking of the board having a role here, um, so you know Bob is maintaining the the list. Um, bring you know anything that's outstanding, anything where the loop isn't closed is on this list. Brings it forward to the board. But I think the board, you know, say Bob says, well, I think what's left to close the list here is X. And maybe the board's view is, well, I think to close the loop here, we also need Y. You know, I, that's what I that's what I'm thinking in terms of the board's role in providing feedback and ensuring that things that the loop is closed. Like we might have be able to share some ideas about um, about you know, okay, yep, great that you're doing that. Also, you know, just make sure we'd ask you to shoot the resident an email to let them know, you know, whatever the case may be, that 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 it got done. So, I fully right. support that, and yeah, I'm back with that also. Bob, I'm going to ask a couple of questions um, just to make sure I understand them. Um, my assumption, and please correct me, is that I'm kind of operating on a packet to packet basis, so that uh, you know, let's say you meet every two weeks, and a packet is done exactly in the middle. Um, the packet, the date of the packet, is the cutoff for emails from residents. Should that also be the cutoff of the period of time I look back over and then report to you? That's my first question. And my assumption is yes, to keep everything consistent, but you tell me. I think where it's where there's something where the loop hasn't been closed it, and it may carry forward a couple of packets. You know, I think it's still on the list. I think it stays on the list until it's closed and it yeah. may that's I don't good. have a problem with that, Anne. The question is, what happens for things that happen after the packet is, is sent oh, to you? Okay. So I, if I could chime in, I think that um, something that needs direct action, action should be taken. Um, the purpose of this list is really catching things that aren't complete. And, and the update is on the stuff that, you know, has there been an update since? So anything new should get acted on already and if it's not acted on or it's not completed then it makes its way onto the list so so that was kind of my second question um and we'll just use today as an example uh, let's say that the cutoff had been last week when your packet was sent and that i was prepared either tonight or either in writing as part of the packet or as tonight as part of the town manager report um, you know to discuss whatever i needed to based on last wednesday and then today a resident asks the board about uh, the um, Joshua Eaton sign. Okay, you know, I answered it, it was easy. Car I copied Carlo like you've asked me to do and the resident went away happy. My question now is, does that need to somehow be reported in the future or is that considered closed? And, and who decides that it's closed? Because I've only let Carlo know because that's what you've asked me to do. You see what I'm asking? Yeah. It's a simple example today, but it's, you know, it could be any example. I think it maybe what makes sense is that um, it's closed, like the board, you don't have to be the one to say it's closed. Um, you could, you can provide us a status update and we can say, thank you for doing that, Bob. Thank you for responding to the resident. That sounds closed. And then we know what's happened then we know that there was a, that you closed, we know that the loop was closed. Cause I think part of the challenge is we don't always know what's happened. Um, so I think, I mean, it certainly is, I can understand why it would be reasonable for you to say like, why would I bring, bring that back to the board that's taken care of? Like, that's a pretty straightforward, that, that is closed, except that the board doesn't know what you've done unless you tell us. So I think it makes sense to be on the list. It's going to be the kind of thing that we can be like, great, thank you, closed. Okay, but tonight I did let the board know. Correct. <laughs> so that is, that's a different, you have, you have in fact, um, closed. That I'm just now trying to make sure that I understand the paperwork because it could be, it could be large or, or not. It's hard to know. Hmm. 
And then what happens when um, the same topic is brought forward by many residents? I think we've d multiple requests on the same topic may be consolidated into one record. The, yeah. the, that is contemplated. I mean, I think it should just, I mean, I, I, it should be like one line in a spreadsheet and we can hopefully be like, okay, awesome, yeah. done, close, on to the next thing, you know? That's the hope. We're gonna yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to go back to it. I think we're overthinking this. Um, you know, when issues come up that have either been raised to the full board or um, that have been raised to multiple board members, you know, it gets added to the list and then it, you let us know how it's addressed. I mean, it, I, again, I, I just think we're, we're over cr creating sort of more policies than we need to. Every, you know, no two requests for assistance or, or inquiry or, or ever going to be the same. I, I think a policy will only work if it's flexible and adaptable with the understanding that at the end of the day, both the staff and the board need to know what's going on in town. Yeah, I don't have any problem. I'm not asking you to change the policy's wording. I just want to understand how you expect it to operate. And just, just to be clear, um, this is for stuff sent to the whole select board. Correct. Yeah, I, I think that, well, so let, let's kind of pull way back for a sec. As you're dealing with things that you think the board should be aware of, the, our, our, our goal is that you're addressing the board with it. And, you know, kind of whenever they, they happen, if it you know, needs to be addressed directly, that's great. In terms of the timing of, of pieces coming in, we're trying to make sure that items that we don't know have been addressed, do get addressed. And sometimes they may not be able to be addressed in, in a few minutes as you were able to today. They may take longer. And the goal was to have a system that kind of catches those so that you see them, we see them, and we can know that the resident's request is being taken care of. So that that's, I think that's the structure that we're trying to accomplish here. So as it relates to things that come up, your town manager report at the meeting could in fact address, you know, if there's something that needs to be addressed directly, it should be addressed directly. Um, if it kind of came up before and hasn't been closed, then it stays on this list or goes on this list. And so it's just, it's catching things that haven't been addressed to the board's knowledge. And then, and then attempting to, to close them as quickly as possible. Is that how other people see this as well? I, I suggest kind of we, we, we played with this a lot. Why don't we try it this way, tweak it as, as it doesn't, it's not gonna be perfect no matter what we do to it. And then if it needs to be changed, fine, we can address it. Does that work? That sounds good. Is there any other areas, Ann, that you wanted to highlight or does that kind of cover the, the story? That covers it. Um, all right, so are we ready to uh, entertain a motion to approve it? So, so let, let's stop for a second. So our process from here, um, we could just adopt this as a select board policy. Is that correct? I think I'm comfortable need, doing that. Do we need a clean version yet? Or? Uh, so it's... Do that? So all the changes are in there let me ask the question are all the changes in there based on the feedback from every and kind of we went through so that the I forget what color it is at this point i the colors i i i don't know what color <laughs> colors yeah, it are. probably varies by by who's doing it but yeah. um um but they yes um Ivria approved the most what's in the packet um there is the one addition that we talked about in terms of an acknowledgement that language. Yes. So if Rhea hasn't looked at that, I do feel pretty comfortable with that. I think it's, I I, I would be comfortable adopting it. Um, I'm comfortable as well. Just the adding of the words about acknowledgement. So why don't we get a motion on this and, and see how the board feels about approving. Carla, can I ask you to, so hang on, I've got, I have this one. Uh, let's see. Oops. Okay, here it comes. 
Oh, Bob, I need to ask you to stop sharing for a sec, please. There we go. Uh, communication policy, please, Carl. All right. Move to approve select board policy, article one, section 1.4, communication as presented. Actually, it should be as amended. Sorry. No, no I, it doesn't say that. <laughs> as amended. Move to, I'm gonna read it again. Move to approve select board policy, article one, section 1.4, communication as amended. Great. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Any discussion? Not appearing. Let's vote as I see you on the screen. Carlo? Yes. Karen? Yes. Ann? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Mark? Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, almost there, folks. So next item I suggested putting on here because um, we received a request to um, kind of talk a little bit more about public records and um, making them available on screen. Jackie McCarthy talked a little bit about it this evening as well. Um, the note was addressed to me um, with the board in copy. <laughs> and so what I wanted to do was let the board have a quick discussion, see um, if we're, we're comfortable putting that together. If so, I would ask um, uh, Bob and staff to take it uh, and, and talks very specifically to Laura Jem, who is kind of the administrator of it in many cases, to talk to procurement. And I don't know if there are others who should kind of be able to kind of take a look at it also. Some of the requests for timing to me seem um, a little bit too stringent um, and probably not necessary. And I wanted to get input from the folks that would actually have to do it um, before we kind of decided what the, what the right time frame was. How does that feel to other board members? I'm fine with that. I see Karen nodding. Carlo? Would, th would this be a separate policy or go back to what Ann said that we're required to do this by law and this would be more of a transparency? Are we gonna put pen to paper on this or is just getting the wheels in motion so it's done? I, th I think it's pen to paper. It becomes an, either an official part of the select, this select board policy. Um, I guess we could decide that or uh, a different new policy, basically a different, you know, here's how we want um, public records to be on the website and here's here's what should be included. And here's the time frame that we suggest. And there's nothing to that effect now. Uh, so the, the big thing is I understand it from uh, what Jackie was talking about is that it includes uh, things like RFPs I think they're already on the website, but contracts sometimes are, are not. And this makes explicit what the expectation would be. Okay. And again, I think we need Laura to, to, to weigh in uh, on it to make sure, and certainly procurement as well, because I think they're the ones most directly touching this uh, and, and responsible to, to get it done. So I know Jackie has, you know, a particular set of interests in what um, she's looking for, but certainly I've heard from other residents um, wanting other information, particularly around um, meetings of different boards, committees, and commissions, recordings, um, minutes, et cetera, being um, more easily available proactively on the website versus having to make a public records request. Um, I think that if we could put the question to Laura um, as part of this, you know, how how burdensome is all of this in terms of proactively putting documents um, online? Bob. Um, one suggestion is that you could invite uh, the town clerk and the procurement officer, and I'll try to think of those others, in to make a presentation to you as to what the current status is before you decide kind of what you'd like it to be or how it might want to change. That's just a suggestion. I like that. I'm good with that too. Okay, I'll, I'll work with Mark on the agenda timing then. But Laura is keenly interested in this topic though, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, it impacts her ability to that. But you know, I think that, um, 
this makes sense as an approach. Let, let, let's see what, what's going on. And, and we also know that there are some specific requests that residents, they couldn't find what they were looking for, or, or, or it, it took a lot of work to get there. And that's what we want to streamline. That's what we're trying to fix. So let's let's see what those are and then and create that policy. Okay, so uh, Bob, can I leave that to, to you to kind of orchestrate with Laura, procurement and, and whatever yeah. else? Okay, we'll fit that in. Okay, great. And then I think that takes us to minutes. Sorry, I have too many documents open to do. Yeah, meeting minutes. So um, how do you want to do this, folks? I actually had a number of comments that I sent um, to Caitlin. I don't know how, how others felt on that. Um, Caitlin, do you have other comments that came in as well? I did not receive anything from anyone except you. How do people feel? So I'm happy to show what I suggested for changes. Um, what's your preference, folks? You get five minutes. Is that enough? <laughs> I think so, actually. Um, Are they just edits or just uh, wording? Um, Can yeah. we just put it on the screen? Yeah. Do you have it, Caitlin? Do you have it? Or do you want me to show it? What's easier? I can find it. Hold on one sec. Um, Caitlin, if they're in the shared folder, I can share them. I I don't think I put them there because it's just in an email, Mark, right? It wasn't a document. Okay. It's an email. email. I got it right here. Um, okay. okay. Um, let me see if I can make this. Is that better or worse than what I just said? Worse. Worse? Yeah, can you try zooming? Oop. Yeah, go, go to full screen and then, um, yeah. And then just, uh, you can go bigger if you can. Yeah, take it all the way across. Okay, and then you see the zoom kind of top right, top right-ish. See if that'll help. There we go. So um, let's see. So those words actually, can you scroll down a little bit further? Did I do this? Okay. So where the section here says, Tom, Tom Manager Bob Washer made a statement regarding the town and school budgets. Um, my suggestion was kind of addressing this a little bit differently. So recently the board was copied on a note from some parents concerned about alleged bias and materials being made available to parents. Dr. Darty read a statement to the community at the last school committee meeting. Mr. Lasher read an additional statement attached to the community, taking responsibility for any hurtful comments directed at teachers that may have come from town or employees. I thought that that was um, closer to um, what took place as opposed to kind of what, what had been there. Actually, can you, is it possible to scroll down a little bit? Or, or actually make the screen bigger. Sorry, this just doesn't fit onto a page very well. Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, he then read Dr. Darty's statement he made at the most recent school committee regarding the teacher's recent actions words. Um, I wanted to clarify it so that people would, who didn't attend the meeting could understand. Can you scroll back up just a little bit, Caitlin, please? Yeah, right there. Comments, suggestions? You want to just add that, correct? Um, I was going to replace. Um, right where it says he then read. To the bottom. I'm fine with that. Okay, 
I wonder if it would help to for for the future if um in addition to the packet, Caitlin, if you can send us minutes as a Word doc, and we can send it back to you with tracking if there's a, a question, and then it will just be lickety split. I yeah, I started doing that, and then I forget why I stopped. But yes, <laughs> no worries. I just I just I this one I had to kind of you know I was cutting and pasting in a PDF, which is never fun. Carlo, are you okay with this? Yeah, I, I, I thought you were just kind of adding. Okay, I see what you're doing there. Okay. Okay, can you scroll down, please, Caitlin? Let's see what else is here. Okay, uh, so here, this was just the in the discussion of um, actually, Carlo, kind of you're, you're in my interchange. The your kind of your comments on you didn't think we should be here, and my comment I thought it was a historic moment moment we had to stand up and support this. I just wanted to put those together, just next to each other. Right now it reads like you made the comment, then the motion was made, then I made a comment. Oh, right. So we can just go up right next to Carla, just move it up to before the motion and that's done. Okay, and then scroll down. There's maybe one other. Uh, so just the description, the, the, instead of a bill was filed for more voting options, bill was filed in the House and Senate to offer safe voting options through June 2021 in time for our local elections in April. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Scroll down. Um, I just wanted to get, is it downtown steering committee? Is that the right term? Okay. So just uh, just to, to name the steering. steering committee. I know it was steering committee. I don't know if downtown was in front of it, but. Can we yep. go up a little bit? I'm sorry. There's a there's a quote from me where Karen wanted all the players involved. I'm pretty sure that, that didn't come out of my mouth, but let's just put staff in there. <laughs> all staff? I'm sure I didn't say players, but I might have said oh. like I all wasn't staff. doing word for word. That I know, I know. Players. But somebody might read it later and <laughs> okay. I know you are doing the best you can. It's eleven. <laughs> oh yikes. Uh, I'm fine with that change from players to staff. And then scroll down. I'm not sure if there's another one. I think that might have been it. I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, oh, instead of uh, the. Vanessa Alvarado noted she would be the point person for communications. I would suggest changing that to Vanessa Alvarado offered and the board agreed to make her the point person. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Uh, Tom Andrew noted he'll reach out to the permanent building committee. Mark Docks noted, noted they. That's interesting. So I ran out of gas. I think, I, I think it's fine. Ignore that one. It, it's, <laughs> Sorry, I ran out of gas on that one. And then one more, I think. So if you're in line, package store license, is there one more comment? Oh, no. Oh, just uh, Anne, I don't know if you need this on your, Anne Landry noted while she can vote on the issue, she cannot sign the letter due to her career. Yeah, yeah. what did you, what did you, I, or her role working for this? That's fine, that works. I yeah, it's not really so much my career. Yeah, it's my job, yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's it. Okay. Any, any, look good. any other changes people suggest? No. Okay. So let's go to the motion. Uh, here we go. I got it. I got it. Okay. Great. Uh, move to approve the meeting minutes of January 19th, 2021, as amended. Second. A second. Second. Thanks, Karen. Any discussion? Not appearing. Let's take the vote. Anne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Kylo? Yes. Mark, yes. Thank you. Last topic. Um, future agenda items. So we talked about a couple of things in terms of climate advisory. Um, 
One of the things that I thought would be helpful, and I think now that we have the communications policy uh, in place, is to think about how we can have some structured discussions, um, probably with, with staff on particular topics. In other words, to create, I, I thought it akin to, you know, ask the town manager or ask the, the whatever, but an opportunity for us to talk with different members of staff and to um, provide them with our questions in advance so they know what we'd like to talk about and to ask them to, to talk to us at the meeting and to, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be here for our next meeting, but I thought it would actually be an interesting approach to um, kind of allow that to take place and to make sure that if we have questions, there's kind of a, a concrete way to address them. So I think it's 11 o'clock and maybe this isn't the right time to have this discussion. <laughs> But I wanted to at least get that idea floating with folks because I think it might be a, a, a good way for us to, to be able to structure our questions and, and ask the folks most responsible to be able to answer them for us. So, Bob. I think the most um, efficient use of your time would be, the board is certainly welcome to ask any questions at any time. I think it would be more helpful if staff answered them in writing in a packet. And then if it takes more discussion, that's fine. We can have that. But to sort of plan segments where people are talking, it's not like you have a lot of extra time in your meetings. It's true. I think the, the what I was trying to Mark, compensate for I, a little bit was- Mark, was it's 11. Can I suggest we table this discussion on how we talk with staff, please? <laughs> we can do that. I think that we need to make it an agenda item for the next meeting though. So I will do that. Um, okay, any other business that we need to tackle tonight? I just wanted to circle back to what I brought up in the liaison report about, I, I had the thought we could invite um, the police chief or, or department um, to have a conversation about, about policies, but um, at, a, at a future board meeting, perhaps in sometime in the spring. Um, but that was something that I had suggested um, to to the chief, but I I I'm I'm not the board my myself as one board member, so just didn't know what the rest of the board thinks about that. I fully support that. I would love to see the chief. We haven't seen him in a while. That's fine. I think that these may commingle at some point, but <laughs> cool. Yes, I think it's a great idea. Right. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't. Just me. <laughs> oh, I think great. it's a great idea. Absolutely. Great. Can I ask one question, Mark? Please, Carl. Are we? I know what. I know what. Blake, are we still trying to move forward to acquire a special license, Bob? Are we still pursuing that? So we have it for town meeting. So Carl, there's been there's been no interest on either specific party. They know that they should approach the board, and and neither has. Oh, okay. So Carl, I think you, you want to bring it back up to the board though to have a discussion about it. Yeah, I, I want to take advantage so we have it or potentially have it and not have someone want it and then we have to wait a year to get it. So let, let's see if we can plug that into March 2. Weren't we going to wait for the census results to come out? Uh, I mean, we so can't keep having this discussion. We, we know the census numbers are coming. Which will change the, the reason the census is important because the expectation is that would change the number of available licenses. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Bob, sure. I, I just want to caution if the board expects to add a warrant article to this April, it, it really can't do it at the same meeting you're closing the warrant unless we have town council present, you know, with drafts. There's always November 10 meeting. Or, I realize or the timing's not ideal, but that's the budget, or um, it, the, the focus tends to be different, um, but that's an option as well. Or a special, or, or an additional. Um, it may be that that's the best way to do it, and then that, again, presumes the board wants to move forward with it, but it sounds like um, that may be a better option than trying to stick it into April. But happy to have the discussion at, at our, let's see if we can put it onto the agenda for the next meeting to talk a little bit more about it, how's that? Sounds good. Any last things? No, Carla, can you make a motion, please? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? 
Second. Thank you, Karen. Uh, let's take a vote, Carlo. Yes. Vanessa. Yes. Karen. Yes. Ann. Yes. Mark, yes. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you all. All right. Take Thanks, care. Folks. Good night. Yeah.